Welcome, everybody, to Scuola Normale Superiore. Today, we are celebrating a special person, and I use the word uh, uh, celebrate uh, with the uh, positive undertone with it. A positive, cheerful person that lived a fantastic life, and so I want this to be the inspiring uh, idea behind all the coming uh, presentations. Um, it's something that we felt we had to do, it's something that we wanted to do, it's something that Lorenzo deserves from, uh, from all of us. Uh, and uh, I'm very thankful, uh, not only personally, but especially as Normale Superior Director at this point in time, uh, that you took the time and came here. First of all, our thank to Paola and, and all the, the Foa colony that is populating uh, that area. And, uh, of course, to all the colleagues and friends uh, that made it here uh, today. We are going to keep a very informal uh, tone, but there are some uh, uh, formal notes uh, that uh, uh, must be mentioned. Uh, I already um, uh, read the message uh, from the then Minister of uh, uh, University and Education uh, at the funeral uh, day. and. Uh, some of you were there, so I don't need to repeat the kind words she had. She uh, knew personally uh, Lorenzo and had special, special non-formal uh, words uh, for him that we all shared. Um, we had then the, the presence uh, of the uh, city authorities in the person of the older woman uh, and colleague uh, uh, Marie Lu Chiofalo, so I'll, I'll give her uh, the word for her welcome from uh, the, the city uh, authorities. Marie Lu. Thank you, and uh, uh, this is a welcome uh, from uh, on behalf of the uh, Mayor of Pisa, Mr. Marco Filippeschi, and uh, all of the municipality of Pisa. Uh, we are uh, glad, and uh, personally, I'm also honored. Uh, to welcome uh, all of you and uh, all the scientific community, scientists from everywhere, who have uh, decided to keep a piece of their time to come here in Pisa, in our town, and uh, celebrate. I agree with uh, the word used by the, the director of the Scuola Normale. Uh, celebrate uh, a, a special person uh, that is uh, the Professor uh, Lorenzo Foix. Uh, there are two bright uh, uh, reasons why uh, we celebrate uh, Professor Lorenzo Foix and uh, reasons why this celebration is important for uh, the whole community and not just the, uh, that is already enough, uh, the scientific community. Professor Lorenzo Foix has uh, contributed in a bright uh, manner uh, to advance the knowledge uh, of uh, the community uh, on uh, uh, the, how, how the, uh, the, the universe and, uh, and uh, the physical world uh, works. And uh, as uh, also uh, had uh, an important role in training young uh, students, uh, young and less young students. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, something very important for, as well for the whole community. And uh, third, he has also taken uh, crucial responsibilities uh, to in decision making for the scientific community uh, from uh, small uh, local communities like uh, the physics department of the University of Pisa and uh, uh, the Scuola Normale uh, to larger communities like uh, the CERN. And uh, this is uh, something very important as well for communities uh, to have uh, persons uh, who are so competent and so, uh, uh, so nice also from the point of view of the human relationships and uh, human values uh, who are able to take care about uh, 
community responsibilities. So uh, for all these reasons, uh, it is important to us, to, to the old town of Pisa and uh, to uh, wider also communities uh, to this uh, celebration. Um, and uh, uh, certainly uh, we are here to uh, share also uh, the feeling and the memories uh, of the men and I also uh, greet Paola and all the family. Uh, we also need as a community to, uh, to um, have the desire to um, uh, preserve and also to, uh, to make the memory of Lorenzo as a man uh, open to all, uh, all of us, to friends, and also people who, have, uh, not, uh, who didn't have the possibility to know him in person. And uh, secondly, and, uh, and last, uh, the uh, memory of uh, uh, Lorenzo and uh, uh, his uh, important uh, ideas and uh, uh, res uh, research success uh, uh, is uh, certainly an example for uh, many uh, students and uh, also for many senior researchers. And so uh, to him, all of us, we can inspire uh, to uh, make our work uh, in uh, all the, uh, the sectors I have, uh, I have uh, listed before, uh, to make our work better and better uh, considering uh, his example. So many thanks to the Scuola Normale and uh, to uh, the other organizers of, of this celebration and uh, welcome to Pisa and uh, good work for today. Thank you, Marilou. There, there is essentially one last thing I want to say in this uh, initial part, which is uh, uh, why the two of us are here and only the two of us. Uh, that's, be that's because the only way we could find to thank uh, Gigi Rolandi, who's the actual organizer of all this. Uh, if he was here, he couldn't have said this. So <laughs> that's why he kept him sitting there, but he'll be back uh, very soon. Thank you very much uh, uh, to Gigi for, for what he did. Uh, as you know, this was organized not only by uh, Scuola Normale, but by INFN and the University of Pisa and other organizations. So the first chairman of the morning is uh, Giovanni. Uh, here's Giovanni. And uh, uh, so you can give the word to me, if I understand, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so I could be able to... Uh, OK, here we go. I'll be quick, don't, 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 don't worry, I'll be fast. Thank you very much, um, uh, and go ahead. Thank you. So, so the, 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 the title uh, I was given is uh, uh, Lorenzo as a professor at Scuola Normale. Um, quite appropriately, I was given the same amount of time of all the others, that is fair. But uh, the role of Lorenzo uh, as a professor and the way he felt about being a professor deserves more, I think, uh, more time because it was a very important part of his life. Uh, and in this uh, uh, brief conversation, I will uh, uh, read some uh, words, uh, his own words, of course, uh, about, uh, about this. I met him when, when I came here at the Scuola in the 90s. Um, and one of the first times I, I heard him give a talk uh, was in one of these uh, Corsi di Orientamento that we organize. Uh, these are uh, public uh, uh, talks, non-technical talks, given to stu high school students uh, to inform them about uh, uh, opportunities and options for the university. He was charming, fascinating, a true magnet. After his talk, I decided I had made all the wrong choices in my life, that I should have done particle physics, the only important thing in the universe. He bought me completely and talked me into it, and all the students uh, at the same time. They were all excited, and I was very depressed at the end of the talk, because, oh, what have I done wrong? The things I do are so irrelevant compared to the things Lorenzo is talking about. He was fantastic, 
absolutely outstanding, unequaled. Uh, he, at the time, was already a professor at the Scuola, but his relationship with the Scuola started uh, uh, earlier. Started with this letter. Uh, I'm not sure you can read it. That's the ugly letterhead of Scuola Normale Superiore in the 60s that we kept until the 2000s, of course, because we stick to ugly things uh, with a lot of attachment here. Let me uh, enlarge a little bit the relevant part, if I can. Here we go. And that's how the system worked at the time. The then director, Bernardini, wrote the minister, you know what, I think I will want as an assistant Lorenzo Foa. And that was it. If I could do that now, <laughs> and if I had that quality people available, I would be writing letters like crazy. Now it is much, much more complicated, and there are not so many bright people uh, around. Uh, Bernardini was very lucky at the time. So how did uh, Lorenzo remember this time? This is an interview he wrote in, to, uh, in 2009. It's in Italian. So I'll give a, a, a more or less uh, uh, closed translation now. So uh, G Bernardini uh, told me, well, you can take a post of assistant professor, more or less, in Normale. Cool, That's, uh, these are his words. I was so lucky, it's real luck in life uh, to get that type of position as uh, a scuola Normale. I really, we all recognize his style and his uh, livelihood uh, in, these, uh, in these words. What did he do? Uh, then. Well, uh, now we start looking at this aspect, which is uh, going to come back again and again. So he said, uh, the first thing I do was just to uh, f find these fantastic young kids uh, the, and students uh, at, at the Square Normale, and I had an opportunity uh, as an assistant there to uh, prepare a whole score of uh, young physicists that they became important influential physicists at the INFN at, uh, at the university. They were so good and so well trained, I add, that they were getting all the positions and after that we could work together. N no comments are necessary. I mean, the, 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 the whole program is, sounds just uh, perfect. I mean, and the, the group got bigger and bigger and was not only Pisano, but was uh, uh, getting uh, larger, uh, opening satellite centers also throughout uh, Italy. These are the, so this is 1968. After that, he stayed here until the 70s, as you know. Then he became a professor in Trieste, then in Pisa, and then finally back to Scuola uh, Normale as a, a full professor. Well, rules had uh, become a little bit more complicated by then. Uh, but already then, the Scuola Normale had a certain procedure to select a professor, so uh, we ask for opinions to external referees uh, before we make a decision on potential professors at uh, the Scuola Normale. So I took one of the letters that was sent to the then director, Luigi Radicati, that says, it's a long letter that starts uh, listing all the accomplishments uh, and uh, his quality as a physicist, but then there's this bit here, that you can read. I assume you all speak English, but in, just to go uh, symmetric, come notate qui dice che, a parte tutti i risultati che ha avuto nella scienza, poi dice un aspetto molto importante di Lorenzo che ha colpito molto chi scrive questa lettera. Forse qualcuno di voi sa, maybe some of you can figure out who the person is, but it's still confidential for 17 years, I'm, I'm told, so I can't tell you, or more than, I forget the amount of time, whatever, I can't tell you, I won't tell you anyway. Uh, so, um, 17 years will be okay also. Uh, ad ogni modo, eh, come vedete dice, molti ragazzi giovani come li ha eh, selezionati e l'impatto che lui aveva su di loro, come loro erano affascinati da lui. Si riprende quella cosa che, che è sempre un tratto costante di Lorenzo, quello di essere un magnete per, per, per le persone. I'm confident that so the professor Fa will make an important addition to the Scuola Normale faculty, one which will open up the field of experimental particle physics to its students. And we did that. Uh, I have no merit because I wasn't here, but we did a good choice at the time as an institution, and Lorenzo was indeed an important addition to the Scuola Normale. So one year after that, uh, he became professor here in uh, 86. And here is Lorenzo's description 
of this process from his point of view. And so uh, Radicati calls me and he says, Lorenzo, and that's typical Radicati, uh, would you be interested in uh, becoming a professor at the Scuola Normale? All the good news came to me by phone, says Lorenzo at the time. And he lists other examples, but I cut them out for time reason. Uh, I have no idea why a person like Luigi, so elegant, so stiff, <laughs> but maybe that's a personal addition. I think I can read that though. So self-conscious could have, who'd want to interact with a person uh, like me, one that would just try to make do and get experiments to work. What an understatement. And then he adds, I can tell you, to the interviewer, I can tell you my surprise when I was, when I became a professor, became a professor at the Scuola. The Scuola Normale is such a stiff, again, place, <laughs> very much into theories that are uh, disseminating their wisdom, etc. Pompous asses, they say in America, <laughs> right? Uh, Lorenzo was so right. Lorenzo was so right. Um, I, I had a number of pictures of, from the time, and I'm showing you one of the Scuola Normale at the time. There was the environment. This was the director. Would you believe it? Quite wisely, Lorenzo stayed way in the back, safely, <laughs> from that stiff type of people that was there. He was a much livelier and uh, positive type of person, so he stayed in a safe region. Some of you are still there. I know that uh, Gigi is there, Italo is there. The guy with the big hair is uh, Morpurgo, really big hair. You know, which, the, anyway, they can get the mouse to work. Okay, here it is, maybe. This guy is Morpurgo with this fascinating hairdo. Uh, a few Nobel Prizes and other people that, uh, that you know here. But then again, going back to the interview, so Radicati calls me and I said, yes, of course they said yes. That's Lorenzo again uh, speaking. And then he goes again to the point that he had an opportunity there to meet young, bright kids and, uh, and train them. At the end of the interview, and at the end of this uh, uh, brief conversation, the, the question was, so what do you consider your brightest and most important achievement? And uh, the last line, I think, is just perfect Lorenzo in a perfect sentence. Uh, I don't think my best choices were made in terms of physics, in terms of political decisions, in terms uh, of anything else. I believe my biggest contribution to particle physics was young particle physicists that I trained. I think that is just uh, uh, perfect. I think that's the way we should all uh, remember him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabio. And uh, now uh, we have the president of Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare, Professor uh, Fernando Ferroni. Ciao, Nando, who will uh, describe us some uh, things about Lorenzo at uh, Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare. That, as you have uh, seen uh, by Fabio's talk, is uh, the institution where he has worked a lot and got a lot of uh, successes and trained a lot of us to these uh, uh, beautiful uh, works that we do. Sorry, I was not able to send the presentation in advance because so. it's quite, quite a complicated day uh, these days. <laughs> Um, we, can, uh, we can ignore uh, the reason for each. So why? <sighs> Fabio, by the way, when, when you spoke, uh, you, you have told uh, twice or several times Lorenzo is, Lorenzo is, so that's, I think that that's, uh, so my, I have seen. Good so good thank you again for your, good, good morning time. again, uh -huh. go, ah, I know, uh, the shredding cat, no, that's my, my cat, and it's still alive, and I can check every day, um, mirror, uh, okay, mirror, sorry, I 
Thank you very much. Thanks for the patience. So my task is to essentially place Lorenzo in the general INFN uh, context. Uh, so I will even, uh, I would have something to say personally, but uh, some, I, I will stick to, uh, to the mission. Um, certainly, if we, in INFN we do not have an hall of fame or something like that, but um, I think because we think we are too young. Actually, we are not. Uh, so we should. <laughs> We should start <laughs> to collect this, uh, this kind of things. But um, certainly, um, let me start with this picture. This picture, I don't know when it was done, uh, but essentially it touches two of the scientific adventure that were certainly at the bottom in the heart uh, of Lorenzo and where Lorenzo helped and shaped uh, the INFN participation into those games. Uh, Lorenzo, of course, did it for the passion of physics, uh, but uh, along the way <laughs> he helped a lot INFN in uh, uh, becoming what it is. Um, let me start with something that uh, he was one of the leaders of the NA1 experiment uh, long ago. I was, uh, I was uh, completing my thesis, uh, starting to decide what to do, and uh, I remember, this is personal, I remember that uh, soon after, in, in, in an era when young people could have some responsibility in INFN, which is no longer the case, so don't worry, um, I, was, uh, I was put in uh, what we call um, structure council uh, as representing the researchers. And I remember that I had, Speranza is here somewhere, so she will remember, that one of my argument is that, uh, look, we have to change in this, uh, in this structure. We have to copy, or at least to do as they do in PISA. What they, I meant? I meant that in PISA they were thinking to the future. They were developing technologies, what today we, would, we should call uh, key enabling technology, according to the European Union jargon. They were not Probably, of course, they wanted to get some results in physics. I don't think that anyone was particularly special in this respect. But certainly, the two, probably many more, but the two contributions that stayed for longer actually are with us today, the programmable trigger logic and the silicon detectors. Those were things that we were not even thinking to do in the place where I was, and uh, I felt uh, somewhat uh, uneasy with this. I have to add, nobody cared what I said, but I mean, uh, the times change and, uh, and, and, and things change. So I, I think that this is one of the things that Lorenzo and his team essentially has left, and has left to INFN and uh, helped the INFN in uh, taking conscience of uh, the possibility of being a key player in developing a technology for this field, but more in general. Um, okay, I just remind you if uh, somebody has forgotten what, uh, uh, what, what is uh, a, a PLU or what is a, a programmable trigger logic. Um, most of you are physicists, so uh, you know already for the others is something that uh, with some uh, module which is programmable, uh, you change uh, your way of taking data and you don't need to reconfigure, reconfigure a trigger system that would take uh, uh, an, an infinite amount of time and uh, certainly some mistake. Not that the programmers do not do mistakes, but uh, it's easier to spot and uh, more economical. Um, of course, this was based on a technology that came from the computing world. And this is another important point, looking at something that is not in, in your field, but you are able to catch up and uh, to transform uh, for your needs. Of course, uh, another, another object that uh, uh, came from NA1, actually, I have to confess that I don't know what, what FRAM means. I, I, I know that it exists, this name, but I don't know what it means. Fragmentation. Fragmentation. Fra fragm, then, not FRAM. <laughs> uh, probably was the, was the title given by the, by the committee, uh, by the INFN committee that was unable to pronounce any one properly and decided to call FRAM. Um, 
Well, silicon, silicon, you know, has been a revolution for, uh, for high energy physics. Uh, silicon has been used uh, in from, uh, in, in, in somewhat evolutive way uh, as a target at the beginning to, uh, to have the decays of charmed particle inside and, uh, and try to determine the, the, the proper lifetime. But then there has been an evolution and uh, only a few years after, uh, I think uh, there is this uh, seminal uh, paper in a physics report uh, that uh, Marcello, you were one of the author, I know, uh, that essentially placed uh, the, the, the present and the future of silicon detectors in the context of high energy physics. I think uh, this has been something uh, really fundamental. So, uh, this is uh, something, a lesson that we shall remember, and uh, it's particularly um, something that I would really like to, uh, to convince INFN uh, that times are not, have not changed much, uh, that we should concentrate on, on being at the edge, uh, at the bleeding edge of the technology, uh, not only on, on catching uh, daily results, uh, uh, that it's, it's okay, but I mean, it doesn't shape the future, I would say. Uh, so Lorenzo was really, in this, in this respect, uh, a, a great example for INFN. And now, there is another story that uh, I, I got directly from, uh, from Lorenzo, but a couple of days ago, I met uh, Antonino Zichichi, well, in Vatican, I have to confess. Um, <laughs> no, it was in the occasion that, Ro but, I mean, nothing wrong, because I met Nino, but Rolf Hoyer met the Pope, so you see, I mean, there are levels of, <laughs> there are levels of importance. Um, <laughs> we, we, we were all, uh, the Rolf, me and Nino, eating together, but the Pope didn't show up, so that, that tells, tells you something, okay, then. Um, at the end of, uh, of the Zikiki adventure as president of the NFN, he managed to, uh, to negotiate with the government a, a, a little increase in the budget, say, of, of, of the institute. Um, a, a huge factor, a, a multiplier, something that now is uh, unthinkable in these terms. And, okay, the budget was then handed to the next president, that was Nicola, but it doesn't change the fact that, uh, that Nino already knew and, and was in the position essentially to, 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 to say what, uh, what to do with it. And, and, and Lorenzo told me once, uh, okay, Nino by himself decided that uh, to, to um, to provide uh, the superconducting dipoles to uh, HERA uh, in, uh, in Hamburg, and that was his decision. Uh, and, uh, but there was another thing, that, uh, at the time, uh, the LEP, there was to, Italians wanted to do LEP, but there was no big uh, uh, experience in, in, in handling big groups, uh, uh, challenging the fact that there were four different collaborations. Uh, uh, the uncertainty in what you could do, because uncertainty, in, in a moment you, you, you show up in a competitive environment and you have to tell, okay, I just have uh, 20 millions and I can build this and that uh, and the other thing, or, or, or you know, or you are Italians and you never know. I mean, you say, okay, I'm here, then we see. Um, and Lorenzo went to Nino and asked explicitly, the Italian community is ready to go to LEP. Uh, can you provide the money or, I mean, uh, we are just uh, joking and then I don't do anything as, uh, in helping in these things. And uh, he said, uh, Nino said, uh, how much, how much, what you do, who are, uh, and said, okay, go. I asked Nino if he remembered the story and actually he remembers the, the, the story. So in a sense, uh, the big success of the, uh, of the well, actually, Lorenzo wanted to do LEP, eh? the plus and minus that was uh, uh, marked in, in the picture is, is something that he wanted to do in physics, of course. And actually, this, uh, this proposal, uh, it's even, it comes even before formal LEP collaboration were uh, really engaged. Um, so the money came, the Italian participation was insured. Uh, um, 
I believe that these were the two subjects that excited uh, Lorenzo more for what I remember and I understand. The one is the number of the neutrino, which was the first measurement done by the lab collaboration, and the other was this uh, desperate uh, X, uh, X search that ended up with uh, at least for Aleph uh, with mixed feeling, I would say, okay? But uh, I, just, uh, I just show the politically correct picture uh, without uh, going into, into any gory detail about that. So, but you see, I mean, this, this, these were the, the Italians, the, the, the INFN structure that participated in LEP. This was something unthinkable before at the scale of the fact that there were different groups, uh, and, and the fact that uh, few, ten, of structure uh, learned how to put their effort together, this was essentially something that has changed, it was a phase transition uh, at large by, for INFN, uh, NA, NA1 was already a collaboration, of, but, but was not a culture that was spread out. Uh, this was a phase transition for INFN. Um, so, you see, thanks to Lorenzo, a couple of hundred uh, INFN people found space and visibility in big international collaboration. And the other is the story that Lorenzo, Lorenzo told me about he going uh, to, uh, to Sinino to ensure uh, the money to, uh, to do. Okay, I think he, he, he has transported the INFN beside them, uh, and above his, uh, his vision and this culture is also brought this INFN uh, um, mark into uh, several important committees around the world. And most important of all, he was CERN director of research in a very, very important period when essentially the future was uh, taking shape, when LHC was uh, in a difficult phase. And, um, and I think he has done uh, an, excellent, an excellent service uh, with INFN style and bringing his enthusiasm. And of course, uh, for him, it was an occasion to help the project that would have certainly fulfilled this dream to observe the signal of the elusive X boson. And certainly, at last, the, the particle appeared. First, uh, on the left, as an unnamed object of 125 GV, and then uh, as uh, the Higgs boson uh, in, uh, uh, with all the clout. Um, actually, this happened, uh, what, be just before this big discovery was happened, just before the start of the LHC, he was uh, the council uh, chair for the CMS collaboration. So I just want to say that NFN uh, will always remember Lorenzo, Few of us have a special, uh, have got a special gift to know him and uh, to uh, to know who, whom he was. Uh, but INFN owes him something really important. INFN has made a gigantic step forward, mainly culturally, thanks to his vision and action. Nature usually is not kind, and certainly. Taking out Lorenzo from uh, this earth uh, so soon, uh, uh, this is not a gift. But at least uh, before he had the occasion uh, to arrive uh, at the fulfilling the dream, uh, the Higgs boson materialized before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nando, for your memories of Lorenzo and uh, his participation in INFN. And uh, now we have Sergio Bertolucci, the CERN Director of Research, that uh, we uh, took us uh, about uh, the Loren Lorenzo's contributions to CERN and participation. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, everybody. So uh, I don't want just to contradict uh, Fabio, but it's also not easy just to stay with him the time for just telling what uh, Lorenzo did in, uh, uh, as a manager of science, not only as a scientist. There are all his colleagues here, which will also talk about that. But uh, what I want just to say, let me fix this thing in a moment. 
is that uh, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, Lorenzo uh, owns the record in, of attendance of SPC. I think that nobody at CERN, not even Ling Evans, has been so long time in the maximum, the top uh, scientific uh, committee of CERN. Because he was there uh, first as uh, an ex-official ex member when he was uh, chairing the SPS committee, then he was called in uh, ad nominem uh, uh, later, and then he was there as director of research. So es essentially he stayed there across the, uh, a, 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 a pretty big chunk of history of CERN. And before getting uh, to, to be uh, chosen as director of research by Chris Levelin Smith, uh, since he was phasing out as a spokesperson of uh, Aleph, he uh, succeeded just to make a very important contribution uh, to all the LHC because he was the only European in this very important sub-panel, uh, which was called, is known as the Drell sub-panel, which was the, the crisis panel set up by the uh, Department of Energy immediately after SSC was cancelled. And we had just to decide the future uh, involvement of, uh, of uh, uh, high energy physics in the U in US. And Lorenzo uh, played a big role there. And uh, I think that uh, he played a big role in this recommendation, which at the end were very important just to allow LHC to happen and just to allow uh, this uh, just to become the first and the more global uh, undertaking uh, in uh, science probably up to now. Uh, this was not an easy task because uh, you remember at the times there was still pretty much the competition between, uh, between the, the two sides of the pond. And the, one of the, of the things which were the statement which were said in, uh, in the US at that time that LHC was not the right thing just, just, just to do because we could not compete with uh, the SSC, was limited in scope, was too ambitious in uh, his uh, parameters. So when SSC was cut, there was a part of the community who was working in the States at that time who said, well, it's finished uh, because LHC will never be uh, a thing which is feasible. Is, uh, is so it's, uh, it's very important uh, what he did there. And uh, you know, the, 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 this uh, sub-panel recommended uh, a scenario, which is, uh, in these days, the P5 uh, has put up his recommendation based on the scenario. So it's a repeating story about the future. And uh, uh, the, the, the scenario was saying, well, uh, the uh, uh, US has just to recuperate uh, all which had been put uh, in the last time in the, the thing by putting the next year 50 extra million a year for the next four years. And at this point, a contribution of the order of $400 million should be conceived because it's very important for this community just to go and participate to this large international effort at CERN. And of course, the 400 million was the maximum contribution uh, allowed in the uh, scenario that there were this extra money, which, of course, the, the Congress didn't give. So this was the starting of the negotiation. And uh, it's true that we all know uh, uh, Lorenzo was a very kind person, was a very, but he has been also uh, the president of Co uh, Commissione Uri INFN, so he knew the value of the money and how just to make, make uh, 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 it ended up that the 400 million became 531 million, which is what the uh, US has contributed to the accelerator and to the, and to the uh, experiment. And again, it's not a trivial thing because uh, <clears throat> putting together two systems which are vastly different, you know, uh, which have a way of accounting which is very different, is not a trivial thing. It is not yet a trivial uh, thing uh, uh, at, the, at this moment. The other problem is that how you organize uh, this experiment. 
because uh, you have to understand that uh, this was really another phase transition. You cannot extend analytically the biggest thing before, things like Aleph or CDF, into what is Atlas or CMS. It is another thing, it's another sociology, it's another constituency. You have 50 countries, 170 institutions, 3,000 people in a collaboration, 1,000 PhD students. It is another thing. And not only that, it cannot be owned by a laboratory. It must have its own constituency. It cannot have a, a, a too much imposing uh, entity which anyway is there because he's providing not only the cappuccino and the pasta but, uh, and the protons, but he's providing all the infrastructure. So you have just to set up something which works, which is not stiff, but which has just to work. And of course, it looks a bit mission impossible from outside, but Lorenzo had a large experience. And I don't mean just to, to, to be uh, leading uh, Aleph. If you, uh, the people here, they have a lot of colleagues, if you remember, I was from at that time. If you are capable of leading from, you are capable of doing anything. You know, uh, you should know these people uh, more closely as I, I, I know them. And uh, so, and so, uh, Lorenzo was a specialist in herding cats, and you herd cats in two ways: fascinating them, and he was doing it, and in case it doesn't work, you move the food, huh? and he was very good in doing both. So. He set up uh, the, the framework which still is with us today, the way in which you regulate a, a collaboration of the size of, uh, of uh, Atlas or CMS. And essentially, he understood that experiments are not a legal entity. So you have just to do something which is a best effort type of memorandum, uh, but you have just to uh, have something which is flexible enough that in case that somebody, despite his best effort, doesn't succeed just, just to deliver, you don't destroy all the, all, all the thing. And uh, no, 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 qua, qua funziona, non era. Maybe that a lamp decided that to disappear. We have a loss of luminosity. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I can continue in the meantime, so we are not. And this is this was. Uh, a very clear uh, image just to separate in the experiment the managing part from the executive part, which has worked in all the experiments very well, give uh, the funding agency the, the, the equal right, a, a sort of a, but uh, put everything under the scrutiny of, uh, of uh, uh, a very internal uh, system, which uh, should do the first. Uh, certification and then, and then have outside committee of different sort re reporting to, 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 to different bodies, uh, scientific, uh, financial, uh, financial, in such a way that the process not only gets approved, but gets somehow uh, looked through its construction. And this was done, uh, th this was done uh, very well, so well that the memorandum of understanding uh, expired at the end of the construction of the experiment, when we started, when uh, we came in as a management, and everybody uh, understood that they were so well uh, suited to the thing that they were prolonged until the next 10 years. And all the upgrades are uh, done through addenda to, 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 what, to, 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 to what we have done. And this, in my opinion, is not a minor achievement. It is a very big thing. The other thing is that he invented uh, another body, which is uh, uh, the, the thing. You know, Lorenzo had the, uh, I, 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 I should also say that before Lorenzo, there were three directors of research. 
Lorenzo was the, 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 the first one just to be single uh, director of research, uh, which uh, tells something about his uh, capability. But it was a very good idea because, you know, he was running a large future project while there was still uh, lab and lab, uh, and lab two uh, just to do. And having more than one director would, in my opinion, not have worked very much. But of course, it was a big load for him. The other thing he's invented, since he was feeling probably just to be uh, not enough uh, occupied, was the mechanism with which the funding agency decide at the end, coherently, uh, just to do an experiment, decide uh, how just to keep it, decide how is accounted the contribution of the people, decide uh, the important thing, which is still working, that is not only important just to build something, but just to operate it. So it will, it is a long time effort. And this, for instance, is not only for the experiment, but also for the computing. So he invented the uh, uh, RRB. But just to give you an idea uh, uh, of the thing th th which he had just to put together in these years, was uh, giving the experiment a sort of envelope. So there was a decision with all this body that the experiment should cost 475.5 million. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And uh, this was, and, the, uh, and then you should make sure that there was uh, uh, enough thing. Of course, you know, CMS by miracle got the same number, but since they are always try just to outsmart uh, Atlas, is. 475.2. This is, this is the, the, the main difference. Uh, of course, uh, the people were lying to their teeth. It didn't cost, so it could cost more. Uh, but the organization which was put up uh, by, by, uh, under the direction of Lorenzo is the same which is today. So is a thing which has worked and it keeps working. And the resource review uh, 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 board is still the body which is not only uh, running uh, the, the, the operation of the experiment, uh, the funding agency, but also deciding about the upgrade and things like that. Is the, uh, the, the, the pain and delis of every uh, research director uh, as said. Because it, it is a very important body, and this structure which was set up which is, looks very complicated, but it works, in which there are the committees, there are, there are things, and the experiments have just to report to different bodies, which in, in turn communicate all each other. This is still working nowadays. And it, it works at a level that essentially even the council, which has a much more vertical thing, understands that is a good way in which you can organize. This is very important because for the next steps, we need just to improve in this uh, model of governance. It's a, it's a key, is a central uh, thing in our field, uh, how, if we want just to have a next step. And Lorenzo provided a big guidance on that. So I think that uh, the community, besides his scientific merit, owns him a lot also for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio, for your memories uh, about Lorenzo Cern. And now we have uh, Professor Manfred Kramer from Vienne. Professor Kramer is the chair of ICFA committee, which is one of the most relevant committee in Europe for particle physics and related uh, topics. And uh, he will uh, tell us uh, his memory about uh, and his uh, contributes about Lorenzo in this uh, ICFA committee. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer and in particular Chichi for giving me the chance to participate in this commemorative event in honor of uh, Lorenzo Foy, a person which I value extremely high. I know Lorenzo personally more from uh, the work uh, within CMS, but I'm sure uh, this will be reflected in the talk by Tim Word in the afternoon. I was asked uh, to uh, discuss the period uh, in Lorenzo's professional life when he was the chairman of ECFA in the years 1999 until mid-2002. 
And before uh, I explain uh, the achievements of Lorenzo in this committee, I'll have to explain a little bit what the committee is. Uh, not all of you in particular, not the family, is aware about these acronyms, uh, uh, committees, etc. So ECFA stands for the European Committee for Future Accelerators. It's an old committee. It was founded in 1963 on the initiative of the DG of CERN at the time, Victor Weisskopf, and the SPC Chairman Powell. So it's 50 year old. And it is not a CERN committee. It is a committee of the European particle physics community at large. But ECFA is advisory to the CERN management, to the CERN council and its committees like the SPC, Scientific Policy Committee, Financial Committee, and is, is observer in uh, many organizations, national and international. National, for instance, the, the ACE Scientific Council, International, there is also an International Committee for Future Accelerators or the EPS HEP board. So ECFA has two bodies. One is the plenary ECFA, which consists of uh, several scientists, mainly senior scientists, from all CERN member states, plus ex officio members, observers, so in total about 100 members. Uh, a subcommittee exists also. This is so-called restricted ECFA. And in restricted ECFA, there is just one elected representative per country, the Director General of CERN, the Research Director of CERN, the Directors of DAISY and the Frascati Laboratory, plus uh, additional ex officio members, usually chairs of other organizations like uh, EPS HEP board or the Astroparticle Physics uh, Coordination Chair. And this restricted ECFA meets uh, five to six times a year and prepares all the decisions, recommendations, etc., which are then uh, uh, endorsed by plenary ECFA. Uh, I said already, ECFA celebrated 50 years uh, last year, and uh, you don't have to, to read all that. For this celebra uh, celebration, I made uh, a list of the milestones of 50 years of ECFA. And let me just point out a few of them. So the first report of ECFA in 63 made a list of recommendations for future machines. The first one was uh, to construct a pair of storage rings in association with the PS. And many of you know, uh, a few years later, th this became the ISR, the Intersection Storage Ring at CERN. Another recommendation in this report uh, uh, proposed a new proton accelerator, very high energy, at that time 300 GeV. This became uh, the SPS about 13 years later. Then ECFA recommended also the construction of the E plus and minus collider. The lab was already mentioned. Again, several years later, lab was inaugurated. And already during construction of lab, ECFA recommended or started the study towards the LHC. So if I stop here, I could conclude the importance of ECFA is easy. Every machine ECFA proposed, recommended, was built at the end. But with ever increasing uh, time span between the recommendation, start of study, and the realization. And there, people with vision are extremely needed, with visions with span 10, 20, 30 years. And one of these list of this milestone is a report on future, of the future of accelerator-based particle physics in Europe, which was uh, uh, distributed in 2001. This was exactly the period where in, in which uh, Lorenzo was the chairman. A quick view to the chairman of uh, ECFA. It started with the first chairman, Eduardo Amaldi, certainly known by all of you. And if you go through this list, there are very, very prominent, uh, excellent particle physicists in this list. And of course, among them, uh, Lorenzo, who had this position for, for two and a half years between 1999 and 2002. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at uh, what happened in this period, when Lorenzo was the chairman, uh, you immediately find uh, uh, in 2002 that he initiated uh, a working group to think about the future of accelerator-based particle physics in Europe. Now, your first thought could be in 2000, in 2000, why in 2000? In 2000, we just closed lab, and we were in the midpoint of the LHC construction. So what sense does it make to think of uh, the far future of post-LHC? But if you think a second time, and of course Lorenzo did, his vision uh, was already mentioned several times here, this was just the right time to think about future projects and to set R&D 
for those future projects on rails. So this working group, subgroup, chaired by Lorenzo, met 10 times between August and July 2001 and published finally a report in 2001. Uh, for those of you who want to go to this report, here is the reference. It's an ECFA report. You find it on the, on the CERN web page. Uh, it has about, the report has about 25 pages. And if you look into it, uh, I extracted the main recommendations from that re report. The first sentence probably is, is obvious. Allocate all necessary resources to fully exploit LHC. Of course, we were in the middle of constructing this machine. But already the second sentence uh, points toward the necessity of R&D for future luminosity upgrade, which we are now finally doing in 2022. Uh, the committee also uh, recommended the real realization of a plus and minus linear collider with an energy range up to at least 400 GV uh, in a worldwide collaboration, I should emphasize. Uh, this is now heavily discussed uh, uh, and called the ILC, probably, uh, hopefully will be realized in Japan. Uh, the report also discusses the necessity of accelerator R&D and varies somehow about losing the expertise in that field. So one recommendation is to improve the educational program in the field of accelerator physics. Then a coordinated R&D effort was requested to determine the feasibility of a neutrino factory based on a muon storage ring. Studies these are ongoing. And the last recommendations I would like to mention here go very far in the future. And they ask and recommend a coordinated worldwide R&D effort to assess the feasibility of a 3 to 5 TV electron positron linear collider. Uh, this recommendation was taken and uh, design study uh, is, was done, is, is still continuing, we call it CLIC. Uh, it also proposes a very large hadron collider, the so-called VLHC. Uh, many of you know that uh, the study has started and this year we intensify the study for this machine. We call it now the Future Circular Collider. And this is a machine which could happen in 2035. So still now it's very, very far in the future. And then there's also a recommendation to study a possible muon collider. So if I still look at some of the recommendations in, in there, which uh, prove the far side view towards the long term future of Europe. And long term future means post LHC. Uh, so I quote from, from the report uh, the, the committee considers it essential that through CERN, Europe should be able to play a key role in the exploitation of the multi TV horizon that will open in the post LHC era. Remember a statement made in 2000. Then the report highlights the importance of internationalization. They, the recommendations should be realized on a worldwide basis. And as someone who was part of uh, the discussion of the European strategy update uh, last year and two year years ago, it is amazing to see that this report in, published in 2001 is really a precursor of the European strategy for particle physics, which we first published in 2006 and then updated in 2013. Uh, Future strategies, uh, the, these strategies and the updates follow the same structure you find in this original report and many recommendations are still valid or have been followed in the meantime. Now, before I close, uh, I have asked a few colleagues who worked with, with Lorenzo in this uh, restricted uh, ECFA committee for comments. And uh, here are some of the comments. Uh, I think I let you read them if you can from here. I like the, the, the second last, uh, the most. It says, those were the days of plastic slides, and his were full of real content, not hot air. I think everybody who knows Lorenzo will sign that statement. And of course, he gave nice dinner speeches, which is important if you are in the positions of one Lorenzo held. So the final slide shows a happy chairman after a REFA meeting. I think it was the last REGFA meeting of him. You may also realize other people on, on this picture. Uh, 
happy but probably tired. And I should explain, these RECFA meetings, these are country visits where uh, the committee uh, discusses full particle physics, eventually astroparticle physics, in that country with the colleagues, funding agencies, politicians, starts in the morning and ends very late in the evening. And the chairman, of course, has to be always there and on top. So that's why he probably looks a little, a little bit tired. And it is late. Don't be confused by the sunlight on this picture. This was Bergen in Norway in May. So this was probably... <laughs> so I think I, I close here and I'm really glad that I did know Lorenzo and I could participate in his missions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manfred. With uh, your talk, we have finished the part uh, uh, about Lorenzo in the institution, or about ICFA, CERN, uh, University, and the INFN. And now we move to Lorenzo uh, inside the experiments, and uh, as you can, as you have seen, it will be also the program of uh, this afternoon. And uh, uh, we have thought to to, to start with uh, one of the latest Lorenzo's uh, students, uh, Giovanni Petrucciani, and. Uh, Giovanni will tell us and, descri and uh, describe the discovery of the Higgs boson and its properties, which is uh, the conclusion of uh, Lorenzo's uh, beautiful career. So uh, we are pretty on time, so we can be relaxed okay. and <laughs> go ahead. So when I actually, when I was still studying in Scuola Normale, the, the fourth, fourth year, I asked Lorenzo for a, 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 a subject, not even for the thesis, just for a, discuss for a discussion but for passing from one year to the next one. And he told me, ah, yes, this is a very good time to ask for a subject of discussion because in the future, by the time you will have to do your PhD thesis, you will be able to do it on uh, one of the first discoveries of LHC. And uh, at least in my case, he was, he was right. And, in saying this. Apparently he said it to most of the students, <laughs> even in the past, but it, it, it was true. So I will tell you something about the discovery of the Higgs boson. So as you know, the, the Higgs boson plays a key role in the electroweak symmetry baking in all our knowledge of uh, the standard model. And the search for it started really, really uh, many decades ago. For example, like. I was looking in the archives and there's articles of the 1970s that complain that still we don't know enough about the Higgs boson and we, we should pursue more the search for it. And it needed a lot of time before we actually got to a result there. So I, I will not try to follow all the, um, all the history of, of the search because especially the very first searches were completely different from what we did in the future and, and what led to the discovery because there was essentially no prediction of where the Higgs boson could have been and so at start they searched it in uh, an environment that was radically different, an environment essentially of nuclear physics. So the, the, at the time at which um, the Higgs searches became m more similar to what then was carried on at LHC, and that led to the discovery was the, the era of LEP. So you know LEP was, um, you can see it, see it here, a circular collider built uh, around Geneva of 27 kilometers with four uh, experiments. And uh, Aleph was the experiment in which, uh, to which Lorenzo participated uh, and many other people participated also to you to the others and then are now in the LHC experiments. So how would LEP try to discover a Higgs? So the first uh, attempt was assuming that the Higgs boson had been lighter than the Z boson. So the LEP collider was a machine that was designed to collide an electron and a positron to build a Z boson. And then if the Higgs had been lighter than the Z, we would have seen decays with the Z decaying into a Higgs, then usually into pairs of big quarks, and 
than giving an off-shell Z decaying, for example, into leptons or neutrinos. So this would have been an ideal environment to search for, um, for Higgs. However, the, 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 the restrictment is that this Higgs has to be lighter than the Z. So unfortunately, it was not so. And so uh, this first period of searches was, was uneventful. Then uh, there was the upgrade of lap to uh, the, the lap two phase, uh, in which the energy of the colliding electrons was increased to at, at the baseline at uh, 192 GV. And this opened an, a new window to search for a Higgs boson with a process that is essentially the same, but here now the Z is an off-shell Z that has more energy, and it can decay. Well, it doesn't decay. I mean, it, it couples to the Higgs and to a Z boson. And so we have this final state with the Z and the Higgs, and it is possible to search for a Higgs boson now, provided that the energy here of the colliding electrons is sufficient to produce the Z and the Higgs. It is a search that was somewhat more difficult than the previous one because you have a more background process that, process that can mimic a signal. For example, you can produce two Z bosons, both of which decay into B quarks, and then in the final state you have four of these jets from the Bs, and it's not easy to, to disentangle it from a case where you have two coming from a Higgs and two coming from a Z. But despite, let's say, the more challenging search, the, the really the, the limiting factor was that uh, you need to have energy still to produce both of these particles. And uh, so the kind of searches that were performed at LEP were searches of this kind, where on searching a Z decaying into jets and Higgs boson decaying into other jets or neutrinos or leptons. And many of the there was many important aspects of these searches that then were critical also in the future searches for the Higgs at, um, at Tevatron, at LHC. For example, the importance of uh, the silicon detectors, in this case for tagging the, the B quarks from the Higgs decay, the, important, the importance of exploiting at the best uh, the, um, the detector to get a, a very good resolution uh, on the mass of the, these two jets, so to see the, the Higgs and distinguish it, for example, from a Z. And that included, for example, this, the, this particle throw approach that was done in, uh, in Aleph to try to really use each component of the detector to, to its best um, potential, and that's something that then was followed up in CMS. And, uh, uh, and also the use of multivariate methods in which several variables were combined together to get the best sensitivity. And this was, let's say, the, the challenge, the, the most interesting and mo most challenging channel because it had the best sensitivity, but also it, it had also backgrounds uh, from different uh, productions of electroweak bosons. And uh, so the search was conducted up to the limit of a Higgs mass of about 100 GV, which was the, what was possible with the baseline energy of lab 2, and nothing was found. Then uh, everything was attempted to increase the energy of, of lab in order to increase the, the energy reach, because there was indirect evidence that if a Higgs boson existed and it, it uh, comply to the standard model uh, properties, then it was supposed to be light. So there was hope that if, if it was not below 100 GV, it could have been not too much above. So really, uh, any, I mean, they did all, all possible things to increase the energy of LEP, uh, connecting spare, part, uh, uh, spare accelerator cavities that had they had taken away before, thinking they were not useful, just, just to increase add any little drop of energy. And uh, what happened is that they started to see a few signal-like events, especially in Aleph, in, in the four-jet channels, events with, f for example, this is an event with four B-jets, 
that would be compatible with the Higgs boson mass right at the border of um, the expectations. And uh, so the, the run was extended a little bit further. Uh, eventually, however, uh, wh while with mixed feelings, uh, I mean, if you read some of the, the articles at the time, so people some really believe that maybe this was the, the Higgs, uh, but uh, take it all together, the result was compatible with being a statistical fluctuation. And uh, there was interest of, of stopping uh, the lab uh, period in 2001, not 2011, uh, to prepare for the LHC, that was about, because otherwise um, it would have not been possible to start the LHC. It was supposed to start in 2005, 2006, so quite early. And still, uh, so LEP contributed to a very strong limit excluding the Higgs boson mass down from zero up to uh, 115 GV from where the, start, the search starts at the LHC. So the, the next chapter is, as I said, LHC that is built in the same tunnel and uh, there's two main experiments, the uh, CMS and the ATLAS, who are um, devoted, I mean, who had the search of the Higgs boson as one of the main goals, and then two other experiments, LHCB and ALICE, that have uh, more uh, dedicated um, goals, like studying flavor physics and studying uh, heavy ion collisions. So LHC had this very um, good feature that it was planned and made in a way that it would have given a definite answer to the question of the Higgs boson. While uh, for LEP, uh, it could say, I can, I, can, I can exclude the Higgs boson within the energy reach of the, of the experiment, but it could still be slightly above. For the, for the LHC, since the, there were reasons to say that the Higgs boson couldn't have been heavier than one TV, LHC was designed so that all the range from the LEP exclusion up to 1 TV was covered by, by design. So if, if a Higgs existed, it had to be found. If a Higgs didn't exist, well, that would still be a discovery of new physics because the standard model ha had to have a Higgs, uh, at least in, in, its, uh, in the version, in the simplest version. So this, this was a sure bet, which instead would have been impossible, for example, in an upgrade of LEP because it could have increased the energy, maybe, but to some extent. But for example, already a mass of 150 GV in the lab tunnel would be out of uh, hope, even with today's technology or tomorrow's technology. So, I mean, the Higgs has this possibility of covering all the reach, the, the, the LHC has this possibility of covering all the reach for the Higgs, but there are prices. So one difference compared to the um, lab searches is that there's ma many more, I mean, background processes, all these, these processes in blue, have rates of events that are much larger than the rates of the Higgs uh, by like seven, eight orders of magnitude. So it is more challenging the search. And also in, uh, in collisions, we produce a large amount of particles, some coming from the primary interaction between the two protons, other coming from satellite collisions uh, among other protons, so we end with events with hundreds or thousands of tracks, out of which maybe in this event four come from the decay of a candidate Higgs boson and all the rest come from other particles. So it's a much more challenging search. So in order to, to tackle this problem, what has been done is compared to, to LEP, the searches focus mostly on decay modes that in which the backgrounds are better controlled. Even if there are decay modes that have a much smaller probability to happen, decays like Higgs to 4 lepton or 2 lepton to neutrinos or 2 photons uh, have, are, sign are signatures that are much more distinctive from what is a typical background event at LHC. And so it's easier to reduce the ratio between the, the background and the signal. And also, to, to focus on searches in which the signal is more manifestly visible, because like for lepton and gamma gamma, the signal appears as an arrow peak over a smooth background. 
So even if one cannot really maybe predict precisely what, how much the background is supposed to be, you would still have an, an, um, a signal that, it, that is clear as manifest because it's, it's a resonant peak that cannot be produced just by chance. And also the other thing, in addition to search for rare decays, is when one searches for decays that are more similar to the background, like Higgs to BB bar, to search for associated production. So processes in which in the final state we don't have just the Higgs, but also other particles like quarks or uh, Z boson. This is essentially a very similar process to the one that was used in the search at lab, if you want, except that use of quarks and not electrons. So for, uh, for to, to tackle the other challenge, the fact that we have pileup and so uh, many more, in, many more than, than a single interaction every time the, the packets of protons cross. This is dealt with by, thanks to the silicon tracker detectors that we have uh, that allow at least for the charged particles to reconstruct all their trajectories and their point of production. So from a complicated uh, event like this, we can identify that some particles come from what we call the primary interactions and other come from satellite interactions and we can remove them and just look at the ones coming from the primary and the picture already becomes uh, much cleaner. And this is an important step in order to then interpret these events. So uh, how then the search proceeds through, through these detectors? Now, there's two, I will describe uh, the, only the CMS one because the one that I know how it is built, but uh, the, the capability, the design of the two detectors is slightly different, but the capabilities are, are similar. And so these detectors start with a pixel uh, uh, vertex detector at the very center that is crucial, for example, for the searches of Higgs to BB bar for tagging the bees. Then we have a tracker of, of uh, silicon strips that is important, as I said before, to, uh, to understand the effect of the pileup and also to measure the momentum of all the particles. For example, it's from the tracker that we will measure the Higgs boson mass in the decays into leptons. Then we have another shell that is the electromagnetic calorimeter whose importance in Higgs surges, for example, is for the Higgs to gamma gamma, which is really driven by the performance of this electromagnetic calorimeter. And then, there is an adronic calorimeter who is some, somewhat less central to in the searches for the Higgs, but it has still an important role, for example, to, search, to identify adronic jets in the events. And then, instead, the hadronic calorimeter in the forward region is quite important for searching for the Higgs because it's what we can use to detect uh, jets from the VBA, from the vector boson fusion production. So that is one of the signatures that, let's say, distinguishes the Higgs with some other particle that maybe could be produced in collisions but is not directly connected to the W and the Z boson. And in this region, we couldn't have afford a tracker or a silicon detector because the, the flux of particles is very large. So here, the forward calorimeter is the only thing that we have. And then the outermost muon system is what allows us to, to tag um, for example, Higgs to form muon decays or Higgs to, to lepton to, to neutrinos. So the search started in 2010, but with the luminosity that we had, we couldn't really already test for a standard model Higgs boson. So the f we commissioned all the physics objects and the main standard model processes showed essentially that LHC was able to redo all the known physics. And some of the first Higgs boson searches was exercises just to see that they were doable. And then uh, there was the, the 2011 run done at much higher luminosity, where both experiments deployed all the Higgs uh, boson search channels, or essentially al almost all the Higgs boson search channels, to probe the whole range from here where, where lab ended to where essentially we didn't expect uh, anymore the Higgs boson to, to be. And through a combination of uh, several searches, each of which is done by uh, tens or hundreds of people to, to really get the best uh, sensitivity to the Higgs boson, we, we eventually excluded the presence of a Higgs boson essentially almost everywhere. I mean, 
up to of, if in all the probed region from the lab bound higher, everything was ruled out except a narrow window. A narrow window where there was a small excess. So some, of us, some thought that, okay, the, the small excess had to be the Higgs boson. There were papers already describing what were the properties of the Higgs boson if it had been that one. Other people were more cautious, saying, well, it could still be just a statistical fluctuation. We had seen statistical fluctuations before. There was a statistical fluctuation, maybe the statistical fluctuation at LEP. So we had to, to do a step more, and we prepared for 2012. Again, also here, the accelerator was committed to do as much as possible to improve the energy and the luminosity to give us more answers, and all the analyses were re-optimized specifically to target the Higgs boson in that window, because at first we didn't know where it could have been, so we had prepared searches for everywhere that were then maybe not optimal exactly in that region. And we had to do all this blindly without looking at the data, because otherwise we could have perhaps shaped the result, whether we believe that that thing, that excess was a Higgs boson or not, by changing a bit the analysis, we could have enhanced or de-enhanced this, uh, this effect. So we decided to not look at all the data for the half a year when we worked at improving the searches. And there was a lot of effort dedicated on uh, specific aspects. For example, for the Higgs to 4 lepton search, that is a search that could cover the, a very large range of Higgs boson masses, but becomes extremely challenging at low mass, where the moment of the four leptons becomes very small. So we had to really work hard to improve the, the algorithms that we use to reconstruct and identify these leptons, so to push the efficiency as high as possible, like manage to have uh, like 96% efficiency for uh, even down to Lab, very, very soft muons and the minimal ones that can reach the outer detectors of CMS. And also we improved the very, by 30% how much we could reconstruct electrons for, to search for Higgs to 4 electrons, in which maybe we expected one event, two events. So a 30% increase in efficiency could mean the difference between having an event or not having it at all. And since to increase the luminosity, they had also to increase the pileup. We had to make sure that our selection efficiencies were stable against this pileup so that we wouldn't have started to lose performance when uh, the LHC would have increased their luminosity. And this is an example of the isolation efficiency. And this is, we managed to get it stable to a per mil. And uh, then we uh, really went through all the aspects of the analysis, tried to recover e every little piece that we could, so that, because we, we knew that even with uh, the higher luminosity and the higher energy, we would have been at the border between discovery or not discovery if the Higgs boson existed. And so, for example, in, in the analysis, originally we expected a distribution like this, and we were just ignoring this small tail here, and then we decided, well, no, let's try to recover also this. Or we had about an event out of 20 where there is a photon emitted in addition to the leptons, and these events, because of the photon, if you don't recover the photon, will have a much worse distribution and will not be as easily identifiable signal. And we so devised an algorithm to recover them, knowing that maybe it would have recovered one event, perhaps two. Possibly nothing, but that event could have made a difference, and, and so on. And similarly for the Higgs to die photon, where the, the critical thing is really to, there, there is a, a very large background of just die photon events. We wanted to, set, we included in the analysis a search for VBF production of die photons, where we expected much less events, but a ratio between signal of back and background to be one to one rather than one to uh, tens or, or hundreds. And we pushed, use all ingenuity possible to improve the, res the resolution for our um, electrons and, fo uh, and photons. So, I mean, if, the, if one were to do nothing, 
the reconstructed, here this is a Z peak, but for the Higgs peak it would be the same, that we would have a very broad resolution, then we get the first level of calibrations, and then the, the best, uh, best of all, that still tighter, and so to, to squeeze, make this peak narrower and thus also higher. And the similar optimizations were done in the Higgs WW search that again was a search designed for a different Higgs boson mass, for a much heavier Higgs boson mass. And to bring it down to, to low mass, to where the Higgs could still have been, we really had to, to fight against backgrounds that at high mass were negligible and instead were quite challenging from the detector point of view, like uh, Z to, to off-shell Z to two leptons with instrumental missing energy. So, uh, at the end of the, uh, the spring of 2012, uh, when we had collected the uh, five inverse femtoborns of data at ATV, we decided uh, that everything was ready, and so both experiments unblinded uh, the data and looked what was there, and, uh, and uh, we saw a signal uh, a clear signal in all the sensitive channels at both experiments that so this confirmed that the excess of the 2011 was really a new particle discovered at, uh, at LHC. So it, it didn't stop there, of course, because at that time we just knew we, we had a particle. So we had lots of questions about the nature of this particle. So if this was a standard model Higgs, then the only thing quantity to measure was the mass. And so, of course, we put an, a lot of effort on measuring the mass as precisely as possible. And then uh, there is another fact that we had observed a new particle while searching for the standard model Higgs. This doesn't mean that we had found the standard model Higgs. So there was many models of physics beyond the standard model that predicted Higgs-like particles. And so the only way to really understand uh, what we had found was to measure the properties of this particle as precisely as possible and decide whether it was the standard model Higgs or something else. So, for example, for the mass, we were in some sense already ready because our searches for in the four lepton and diphoton final state would yield a narrow peak for a signal and the position of this peak was the mass of the Higgs. However, there was an extra ingredient that we needed to measure the mass compared to just doing a search for a signal was to make sure that the position of the peak was calibrated correctly so that all our energies had the proper scale. Otherwise, we would have still seen a signal, but we wouldn't have been able to, to track where it was. And so there was a long process of uh, improving our knowledge of the electrons and muons in order to get the best precision on the mass. It is remarkable that still, already at, at the day of the discovery, we, we had a measurement of the mass of the Higgs boson with half a percent precision. So really, we jumped from, from zero to, to precision physics uh, immediately. And then, since then, there was another factor two improvement with more data and uh, a lot of effort in calibrating better our detectors. And the other statement was try to understand whether this is a Higgs boson or not. And the way we approached it is by measuring, searching for it in many final states, even states that didn't have enough sensitivity to discover it on their own. But check in, if in all these final states the amount of signal that we saw agreed with the standard model predictions or not. Because many alternative models that predict a particle to see, that could be seen at LHC don't predict exactly the same rate as the standard model Higgs in all the corners of, of the searches. And so we did plots like this, where these were the five different Higgs boson decay modes. And for each of them, we measured the amount of signal, some, some cases more precisely, some cases with larger uncertainties. But we see that everything was lining up with uh, the standard model predictions. While in principle, all these could have been arbitrarily different numbers, even an order of magnitude larger or smaller. And we went even further and tried to really search for deviations in the way this particle coupled to the other particles. So we had that this particle is produced in some process, and then it decays into some decay channel, and the expected uh, yields 
depends so on what is the production cross-section, the, 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 the branching fraction in that decay and the overall width of the particle. And we expressed all these three terms in, in terms of some coefficients that changed how much this particle interacted with the other amount this Higgs boson interacted with the other particles of the standard model, like for example for the decay into the B quarks here, the, the gamma of BB was the coefficient, the interaction between the Higgs boson to the B quarks squared times the prediction for the standard model. So it's something similar but is really more focused on the physics that can affect here and here in a consistent manner. And to perform these searches, really we had to analyze um, hundreds of different final states, some in which the signal is very clear, like this is the, again the Higgs to 4 lepton, you manifestly see a signal, but this production you're only testing a Higgs boson that is produced from two gluons and decaying into two Z, so you can only assess the couplings to the gluon, the effective coupling to the gluon, and the one to the Z. If you want to measure the coupling to the BB bar, for example, you would need um, a search like the Higgs to BB bar where the signal is smaller and you're sensitive to the coupling of the B and the coupling of the Z. Now, with just two, now you're, you still have degeneracies and so you go and test lots of different final states and eventually measure all the, all the possible couplings, at least the ones that to, to particles that are visible at LHC. And uh, the result was that the observations were in remarkable agreement with, with the expectations, which can be seen either as a very good thing because uh, it confirmed what we expected or a bad thing because if they had deviated by a lot, then it would have been a sign of new physics. So coming to the conclusion, after decades of searches for the Higgs boson, eventually one was found at the LHC and this was possible not just because of the LHC, but also because of all the legacy from LEP and Tevatron and the methods, measurement, auxiliary information that then was used in the search. And uh, that this is not the end uh, in the sense that uh, there is still a lot of questions to ask on whether this is what we predict, what had been predicted or not. And so there is a, bit, a rich program of measurements of the Higgs that could lead to new discoveries if this is not just the standard model Higgs. And the program has already started on the data of LHC of this year, but we expect a lot more when we will have the run two and the high luminosity search or possibly even future colliders. It was said before that we, there are plans of, if this is the LHC and this was the previous one, the, the, of building an even bigger collider that would give us uh, precision physics for the Higgs and, uh, and possible new, new discoveries. So there is a lot of, it's, it's for sure not the end of the, the physics of the Higgs boson, it's just the end of the beginning. Thank you very much for having shown us this beautiful discovery. And now a couple of communication. The first one is that we meet again at 2 sharp here. And the second one is that the lunch will be served down uh, now or in uh, now. OK, so thank you to everybody for having come here. Thank you again. And uh, see you later at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much.
Please take your seat. Thank you again to, every, to everybody for being here today. It's a very important day for uh, all the big FOA clan and also for me. <laughs> and uh, um, two things about the program. Um, uh, with some modifications near the end, uh, Paola uh, will say a few words near the end of the session. It will be in Italian. And, uh, um, but we will try to finish before five o'clock in order to, so that everybody can leave for the train. But at five o'clock sharp, uh, there will be 10 minutes of the chore of the Scuola Normale. Many people do not know that Lorenzo has been for decades, huh? <laughs> 10 years, more, even more than that, the president of the, of the chore of the Scuola Normale. And so they have very kindly agreed to make a performance for us today. It will be 10 minutes with uh, two motet of Palestrina. And uh, it's especially done in memory of Lorenzo. Today is a working day and all these are volunteers. And so people coming from, uh, from the, the, all the, the Tuscany in order to give this performance in celebration of Lorenzo. Okay. So I think uh, I can introduce Professor Fidecaro <laughs> that will chair the afternoon session. Thank you, Gigi. So welcome to everyone. And I call Professor Pierluigi Braccini, who will tell us uh, about the early experiments. Allora, io parlerò dei primissimi esperimenti di Lorenzo, affrascati eh, a Hamburgo e al CERN per finire agli ESR. Quindi farò un po' di storia e, e parlerò degli anni, essenzialmente degli anni 60, gli anni del miracolo economico italiano. <ride> Qual è la foto? Questa? Oh, hai scelto di essere. Non passa la foto. Ah. Ok, thank you. Thank you. So, I will speak of the 60s. And, uh, and in part of the, of the 70s, in which we were at CERN. And I wanted to begin with a, this picture, with, with no comment. Uh, I, I asked people to concentrate on the picture and, and to try to uh, go back, uh, if you mind, uh, thinking of the 60s, that I mentioned was the years of the Italian miracle. And then uh, we see also in the 50s, what, which was the situation, was completely different from now. I, I find this photograph very nice in a sense. It's very, it's very sad because it freezes the time. That refers to the first 70s, this one, so the end of the period that I'm discussing about. And uh, uh, Lorenzo is there, he was the assistant uh, at the Scuola Normale, and Bernardini was the director of the Scuola Normale, as you understood this morning. And uh, Bernardini is the past because it was extremely important for the reconstruction of Italian uh, physics after the war, together with, with Amaldi. So in Rome, there was the war, and uh, Amaldi, Bernardini, they were there, and they tried to, to go over with their things. And uh, they, they, they pushed an idea going back to 1931 to build an accelerator, an Italian accelerator. And then uh, happen everything happens, the war and so on. And Bernardini was always there uh, pushing and trying to find a future, future for, uh, for us. This, previously, uh, what happened in the 50s, you see, uh, there was the birth of INFN, and that Bernardini was the first president, so again, the importance of Bernardini. 
There was the decision of building the electrocyclotron, and uh, it was created the Sezione Synchrotrone, which was uh, independent administration and everything, was seated in Pisa because Salvini was in Pisa at that, at that moment. And uh, then in 54, uh, the foundation of CERN, and then in 59, so in, in few years, Frascati had the electron synchrotron and CERN uh, had the PS ready for, for experiments. So in a uh, few years, you see, that there was a big uh, improvement of the, of the situation. This is the uh, Frascati synchrotron. Uh, we had one GV uh, photon beam and uh, there were plans to study photo production, there were uh, the new found resonances. Electrodynamics, because one has to think, going back, that uh, QED came out in the 40, 1947, and the Nobel Prize was given to the people in, 50, in, 60, in 65, so was, everything was very new and was not uh, so metabolized by, by, even by the physicists, the old physicists. Uh, just metabolized hardly quantum mechanics, which was not so old even. So, I, I want to say which was the situation in Piazza Torricelli. In Piazza Torricelli, there was one professor, Puccianti, who died, who retired in 1947, and then the direction was taken by a professor, because you needed a full professor, which was at the Naval Academy in Livorno, Carrara. They, they, he was a part of a group who studied the microwave, the radar, with Tiberio, the professor of engineering here. And then uh, this was the start of the microwave group in the, in, the, in the institute, in the Institute of Piazza Torricelli. And then there was nothing which concerned high energy physics, uh, what it was at that time. Then Conversi came. And then he started the reconstruction. You see the long list. I, I wrote down, uh, Conversi began to hire normalisti, the young students coming, mostly normalisti, but also other students. And then they put on a cosmic ray group. Uh, an important uh, achievement was the invention, with, together with Gossino, of the flash tubes, which was the beginning of the, uh, the spar chamber, uh, which had a, a long story afterwards. And then I wrote down the, the cosmic ray group and then, and then the bubble chamber group and with Manelli, Bertanza, Tallini, Franzini, Manelli, Sant'Angelo, Silvestri, these were just uh, ended their study at the university. And they, uh, the, the one I brought, uh, all from the Scuola Normale. This is all from the Scuola Normale. Uh, the, 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 the computer, the um, CEP, which was Calculatrice Electronica Pisana, was built, uh, and that with, with the money which uh, remained from the construction of the synchrotron, which was made in Frascati and not, and not here. So that was also important because we had a, a computer built, and that was the start of uh, information science in, 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 in Pisa. Then, uh, uh, Salvini made the project of the accelerator, he left in 55. Radicati came here, and that was the start of the theory group. I wrote, well, I don't want to say the name, because I don't see many of here, of theoreticians, but uh, we have colleagues of that, uh, Picasso, and so on and so forth. And uh, I have to mention that Radicati gave the first serious quantum mechanic course at the university, and he had to find somebody in Padova to help him in making the exercises. The, the, so that's just to give, a, to give you an idea, Pusterla, you remember? <laughs> uh, and then was the start of the theory group in Pisa. It, it happened, Radicati remained here, then he came to the school normal, he was director, so I put dots because it, it was Pisano from that moment. Then Franzinetti, he stayed few, not many years, and with Franzinetti we had a Again, he, he hired a lot of people, new people, and he put on groups that to start to work at Frascati and at CERN. So, by uh, in that uh, frame, Lorenzo came to Pisa. Uh, Lorenzo got his laurea in Florence in 1960, studying a low-energy nuclear physics reaction. 
Eh, Carlo Franzinetti was helping Giorgio Bellettini to set up a Paesino photo production group in Pisa to do research at the new electron synchrotron. He suggested Carlo Bempola, who already had one year experience on the floor at Frascati, to move from Rome to Pisa and Lorenzo to leave Florence to join the new group. So Lorenzo, I, I was tempted to put this from Niobium to Higgs, because this is a long way, because Niobium was the, um, what is the isomeric state of Niobium was his, his thesis. So it was a long uh, story. And then uh, the photo production uh, group uh, was founded, and uh, I personally was working in Frascati to do uh, an electrodynamic experiment, the annihilation of the positron, and I met Lorenzo there. I met Lorenzo, they were testing some uh, photomultipliers on, the test, on a test beam. And I remember Lorenzo the first night, it was a night shift, Lorenzo was dead and he, could, he, he was always very good, he's sleeping everywhere. And he was sleeping on an armchair and on top of the armchair there was the telephone and uh, we had contact with the laboratory during the night. Lorenzo was sleeping perfectly. That was my <laughs> first, <laughs> first view uh, of, Lorenzo, of Lorenzo. So the uh, photo production group was, I remained in Frascati, I joined the group, and so this was the group, four people. You see the, the oldest was the 20, 28, and um, all of us in, completely inexperienced because we had to learn from scratch on the floor, and, and we were learning from ourselves, from our mistakes, so the, 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 it was a lot of fun, I have to say. And you see how lucky we were in respect to the young people there. We were 28, 27, 26, 25, the age. We have Edmund Bellamy, Ted Bellamy was our coach in a sense because he came from the United States and he had already some experience in accelerators. And so he pro provided advice of key, of key importance. I mentioned the technicians also, all young, all under 30, 30 years. And then uh, if I was able to give you an idea of the theory that uh, physics uh, was uh, metabolized by people, this is the Primakov effect. Now you find this on, uh, on the Google, you just push, you find figure effect, uh, figures, and it comes out this. And then you see, for us, this photon which uh, hits the, in the field of the nucleus, it means a virtual photon, it calls to produce a pi zero, and then the, 1951, uh, Primakov had uh, calculated the cross-section for this kind of thing. Uh, apart from the difficulty of the experiment, uh, uh, because everything was peaked very forward, we were at the electron synchrotron, so the beam was carrying a, a lot of rubbish around, we were uh, to detect two photons uh, from the pi zero, the pi zero decay, but we were not even convinced that this effect existed. Uh, not, not only that it could be measured, because was so, so fancy, if you want. We were not convinced yet that everything that can be produced is produced at that moment. So we did also another experiment, a normal photo production experiment of phase zero on hydrogen, because that uh, was, was sure. So it was a, a, the, 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 our the, the saving. <laughs> and then we, we, were very, we had a lot of courage to, to do this experiment, and we were pushed by Franzinetti in, uh, to, to do this. Uh, this is the group at that moment. Carlo Bempola dismissed him because he's behind the camera, and you see Giorgio Bellettini, uh, is for, he was the oldest one, 28 years old, and he was uh, a natural. You know that uh, we accepted as a group leader. It was obvi obvious that is uh, <laughs> who could contrast him. Uh, and then this is another uh, in front of the synchrotron. And the, here is Giorgio Bellettini taking the photograph. This is Carlo Bempora appeared there. And, uh, and, and, that's, and, and we started the experiment. Oh, Paola helped me to, to go across the papers of Lorenzo in these days. So, about the Primakov, our measurement of the Primakov effect, I found a old transparencies of, Lo, of Lorenzo. I, I think that the students here have seen this a lot of time. There are some, because they, they go back at that time, and they, he was explaining how to, to make... A, a, oh. 
uh, our experiment was made, how to, to isolate uh, ETAs, uh, and then the cross-section, uh, and everything. So this is Lorenzo who is uh, explaining to us the, it was always very clear in the, in the lessons, and very um, precise. He produced this kind of slides of transparencies, and uh, I'm sure it has been seen. We spent a lot of time in uh, the analysis also. The Monte Carlo, uh, Monte Carlo for the efficiencies in terms of energy and angles of the produced pile was made at the computer in Pisa, a chap. We had the collaboration of a mathematician, a friend of ours, who had to write even the random numbers uh, routine and use the Pisa Pride, the numbers of Fibonacci, to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and after that, uh, we had to multiply section, the matrices of efficiency by the cross-section. And with Lorenzo, we spent night uh, doing these kind of things here and in Frascati. Uh, I apologize when I say sometimes something about me, because really, with Lorenzo, we were together uh, elbow to elbow for these ten, 10 years, so sometime uh, what we, we have done, what we have thought was the same thing. <laughs> the, this was, you see, the Primakov effect was seen. The, that was the first observation of the Primakov effect and this first exploitation for measuring the pi zero lifetime. So we are very happy. It existed, the Primakov effect. You see, uh, Ricardo, you, understand, you can understand me. <laughs> that is, and uh, these are the results, which are not so bad because after in 2012, this, again, with the Primakov effect, this is the new measurement which reduced the error by a factor of uh, five something, something like that. So it remains. At that moment, the, the eta particle appeared, was discovered. We realized immediately that uh, we could measure the lifetime of the eta particle. Uh, and what we did, we involved Marco Toller, another pupil of... Uh, this kind of normal, a theoretician, to, make, to help us in making the calculation the, uh, by hand to find efficiency, the rates, and things like that. And then uh, 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 this slide shows how uh, things went. And Bellettini had presented the proposal to Daisy. Uh, the proposal was accepted uh, immediately. And, and then Giorgio left the group because he went to, uh, to CERN to work in the Cocconi, in the group of Cocconi at that time. And uh, here are the steps. You see Giorgio and Lorenzo and the Elbe, the, Elbe, uh, the, the river in Hamburg, in the foggy north. Uh, here is Professor Stalin that we met there. And uh, Lorenzo and I, after the acceptance of the proposal, spent a week, I remember, in Bonn. There was Professor Paul there, uh, which we had to convince him and the, and the people there, because Hamburg was not an international laboratory. So we were the first group going, going there. And so we had to accept a collaboration with the, German, with the German group. And so we went with the group of Bonn. And we found uh, two wonderful people, uh, Klaus Lubesmeyer and Detlef Schmitz, which we became friends uh, for a long time. And then uh, uh, in Hamburg, we met Jenschke, which was the director of the laboratory at that moment. And Professor Stalin is just uh, helped us in uh, going around. Lorenzo moved to CERN. I wrote down here the Vonotron. The Vonotron was the uh, guest house of CERN. It was put there in the, uh, for administrative reasons, because they spent money in building a, bu a building. <laughs> so that was named the Vonotron. That was, and Lorenzo moved his family, he was a young father, he moved the family to Hamburg, and, they stay, and he starts to speak German. What it, what it means that uh, Lorenzo and I, we, we, before moving there, we did not know anything of German, any German, so we, we had some lessons of German here in Pisa, and then we went. Uh, and Lorenzo immediately started to speak to people. We, he, for him, a couple of lessons was enough. That was a good example of how Lorenzo, uh, is, about Lorenzo's easiness to contact people. And he could learn German much more efficiently than we did because uh, we were more shy. We did not speak to the people. He was speaking to the technician, to the shops around. To, and so he spoke German quickly. 
And Paola uh, also started to learn German and uh, with a good proficiency, I should say. <laughs> this is the uh, counters before being uh, installed in the beam at, at Hamburg. And this was the experiment in which, again, we see the ETA. The experiment was very similar to the one in Frascati. We could uh, uh, isolate the ETA uh, to two photons decay very easily. And uh, the Primakov peak was very visible. There, the situation was different because the energy was higher. And then the, the results, we derived the... And the results, unluckily, we, there was not a a good model for a coherent photoproduction from the, the nucleus. So we overestimated the contribution of the, um, um, of the Primakov uh, uh, diagram. And so we, we obtained a lifetime, which is the data are there, but the analysis of the data could have been done again. Now the present result of the particle data group is the one that, that is shown down. This is the Primakov paper with uh, Lubesmeyer and Schmitz. And uh, uh, we had a very good time also with, we were helped, and I have to, uh, we owe them the, their friendship, Lubesmeyer and Schmitz, they never tried to uh, steal the experiment from, them, from us. They were really good <coughs> friends and we went on, we remain friends until, until today. It was organized, oh, oh, in, in there we met, uh, uh, another group on the same beam line, there was something <laughs> making the experiment of uh, restoring the, the uh, retrodynamics because it was put in uh, jeopardy by the result of an experiment by Pipkin in, in the States. And Ting uh, made the, the electron pair experiment uh, established that the retrodynamics was, was working. <laughs> so, uh, and that was our first contact with Ting, which uh, would have gone on longer in the, in the future. We organized a football match. Lorenzo was never much uh, sporty, but he took part to this one. And this was a false part stadium, you remember. The, for the, there, was a, there had been a match in Italy-Germany, and so we organized another within physicists. That is the... Then uh, at that moment, in, we remained in Hamburg, few of us, and we invented, we found in the data, new methods of detection, uh, and uh, we do, did other experiments, thanks to the addition of people like Bradaschia, who was the, the, the second laureato di, di Lorenzo, he came from Pisa, and he joined the group, and Rino Castaldi, and uh, these are data which are very funny, because uh, a, a particle decaying in pi zero gamma, is there is high probability for a particle like that, that for the pi zero to send the gamma in the forward direction. So it is nearly, it is nearly a two photon decay. Uh, obviously, the, the lo loci of the events in the two energy are mo more spread. And this, you, you, we could see, we could, uh, <coughs> we could measure the photo production of the media. You see here the eta is very well. And nothing there, and we gave an which uh, did not decay in, uh, in pi zero gamma. And that was thanks to the uh, new addition to the group, because in the meantime, I, I uh, also, uh, I was moving from uh, Pisa, Geneva, and, uh, and Hamburg. Lorenzo was in, in Geneva, they came, new, and the, uh, Giorgio Bellettini in CERN, try to prepare a new experiment because we needed to, to produce. Uh, and uh, the next slide shows that the first results of the polarization experiment with Dick, uh, by the end of 68, we had already results of that uh, uh, at CERN. So you, you, you can read the, the people here, they are Bellettini, who joined, they went back and came to CERN, this is the paper we speak in a moment, Lorenzo, and this was to addition new students from Pisa, so younger than us. These were the young people who were very old at that, at that moment. Uh, and and uh, uh, very important was uh, Nino del Prete because he was the one who moved to CERN in '66 and did part with Giorgio to the design of this experiment, which was a very 
difficult experiment with technically very, very advanced. I see, I see the, the chairman who is moving, so I, I go fast. This is a slide that I presented at the Lorenzo Fest many years, Lorenzo at the ISR. This is the full view of the R801. The Pisa Stony Brook collaboration was a series of four pi de, de detector, uh, and uh, Lorenzo contributed to all part of this the construction, uh, uh, setting up uh, electronics, everything. And here you see, you can see, uh, this was sent uh, for the Lorenzo face by Paul Granis, the one of the people of the Stony Brook uh, group. This is Nino del Prete, was the first, uh, he came from Florence after Lorenzo, he was the first man of Lorenzo. And uh, we owe him uh, the, the, the technique of our experiment, electronics, and mostly the online. Uh, you see him here, we are in uh, the, the beginning of the 70s. Uh, here is, um, he's sitting down with the computer. I don't remember the, which one, the 15, 15K of memory. That is. Uh, uh, <laughs> 32, 32, yeah, that, it be exactly, exactly, so that was not far ago. So uh, we had two wizards of uh, online and uh, electronics, one that was Nino and the other one was Guido Finocchiaro from uh, Stony Brook. I go on, this is the measurement of the total cross-section, the rising total cross-section, and uh, uh, I show you this paper uh, because of the names of the people. The, there are 15 people there. Again, all of them, young, uh, is the sum of the people who joined the, the experiment. And uh, uh, I found interesting this uh, Giacomelli and Jacob, uh, physics at the ISR. Uh, many ISR experiments have had a very broad scope and often corresponded to a research of pro program rather to what, what is usually considered as an experiment. Until that moment, we were making experiments. And the experimental condition could not be readily assessed. The experimental group needed the liberty to adjust the program as they say fit. In some cases, this is particularly true for I I I one one group collaborated with other groups at the same intersection in order to have a more powerful detector. We collaborated with Rome to measure the cross-section independently of luminosity. We collaborated uh, with, Stony Brook, with there was the Stony Brook Pisa, not the Pisa Stony Brook, because they uh, built a detector of IPT pions, uh, pi zeros emitted, and then we studied correlation and things like that. Uh, another important point, what I want, I sh I've shown this just to see, I connected to this morning. Physics changed at that moment. The detector changed, the experiments were completely a different things. And the 15 people that we've seen before is a small number. So, uh, the full solid angle coverage of the otoscope are combined with momentum measurement, uh, Stony Brook, in some limited solid angle, gave access to many exciting discoveries. We found uh, scaling, limiting fragmentation, short and long range correlation, jets in the two walls and the wayside. And we had, had a lot of fun in using variables which are new, the cosmic ray variables. Uh, uh, and by Lorenzo initiative, part of the group was led very naturally to envisage a new, more sophisticated spectrometer suitable to such a kind of physics. And uh, in this sense, I remember Aldo was one of the designers, Aldo Menzione was one of the designer, main designer of FRAM. That is the... Uh, but, 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 uh, the, the, the 70s had been a very rather, rather fruitful years. You see the partons, uh, the partons are quarks. The, the partons uh, in, in PP, we see partons, uh, jets and so on, neutral currents uh, were appeared. And then, 74, uh, the J Psi. And that changed the world. Uh, the, the, the kind of physics that we had done at the SR was of very limited, no interest at all. So, FRAM was designed, and then you heard, will hear about that, was designed on the on the kind of feeling that uh, we had to study something else. So that, uh, and, but the, of that you will hear after. I am at the end. Uh, 
the many rules of uh, high energy physics in Pisa. Lorenzo et Ada went in different directions to exploit fully their different styles and methods of work. At this moment, I separated my life from Lorenzo's life, not life, because we remain in, in contact uh, until uh, today. A significant fraction of the present Pisa fame in counter experiment grew out of the work of four people who started their career at Frascati in 1962. Lorenzo was one of them, and one of the most important. They were not so special, but were among the very first. And this uh, was the contribution of Giorgio, the conclusion of Giorgio Bellettini at the Lorenzo Fest. And I copied that uh, because I think it is interesting. My own conclusion is the following instead, day after day with Lorenzo. In 1973, the group consisted of 15 physicists, still young and ambitious. Each one had matured his own very different individual uh, tastes, attitudes, and skills. From the very beginning, Lorenzo understood that this variety was a key factor for the vitality of the group. But life was not always easy in such a condition. But the group worked successfully together, thanks to the continuous presence of Lorenzo and his calm approach, his openness, his readiness to listen to everyone, his complete lack of arrogance, his love for understatement, and his mastery of smoothing over the, any difficulties. I had the privilege of enjoying a deep friendship with Lorenzo, which lasted for more than 50 years. Thanks, Lorenzo, and goodbye. Thank you, Piero, for this nice presentation. I think comments should pop up during the presentation, so I, I skip directly to the next. Uh, hmm? Okay. Ah, there, is, there is a letter which will arrive. Okay, so we, sh we should continue. I am afraid I have to be timekeeper. And so we have uh, Luciano Ristori on about uh, continuation, Lorenzo and Fram. Okay. So, Lorenzo and Fram. Well, you know, Fram was an important step in Lorenzo's career. For the first time, instead of being just a member of a group, he stepped up to be the leader and the spokesperson of a, a big collaboration for the time. And that lasted for about 16 years. So what is Fram? Fram is officially known as NA1. And if you look up in the Inspire database, NA1, this is what you find. The CERN NA1, measurement of the photoproduction of vector and scalar bosons. Spokesperson Lorenzo Foa. Okay. Um, NA, what NA stands for the north area of the SPS. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. So you see the SPS here, it was commissioned in uh, 1976. Uh, this is, uh, of course, a diagram of the uh, CERN accelerator complex. Uh, the SPS is 300, yeah, 450 GeV protons. Two main experimental areas, areas, the west area here and the north area over there. This is where NA1 was installed. This is an aerial view of, uh, of, of, of CERN, and you see the, this is the SPS, and the arrow is where the north area is, more or less. And of course, the big ring is the, the lap ring, which is now, now the LHC. And uh, the experiment, NA1 was installed at the end of this very big hole, actually, that was there. And NA1, and one stand is one because it was the first experiment that was approved for that, for that area at CERN. So what was the experiment? It was coherent photoproduction of charged, of charged, of charged uh, uh, 
of charmed particles, coherent product, product production of charmed particles. And you have a, um, a high energy photon interacting with a nucleus in a, in a target and producing a pair of charged particles. And it's produced coherently, that means that the nucleus does not break, it just stays, the nucleus stays together. And it produces, it, a, a pair of charmed particles are produced and nothing else. And the charmed par charm particles decay, uh, this is not, the charm particle decay and the decay products are measured in the spectrometer. You see here a schematic layout of uh, the whole experiment. An electron beam goes through a thin uh, radiator, lead radiator, and uh, gamma rays, I mean photons, high energy photons are produced by Bremsstrahlung. The electron uh, energy is measured in the target system and you get the energy of the photon by difference. And the photon goes through a target, hopefully it interacts in the target. And then you have the spectrometer. The spectrometer is a, basically a string of magnets. And in between the magnets, you have drift chambers for detecting charged particles and the shower detectors for detecting neutrons. You have here, this is a picture of the experiment. And you can see the main features. The, uh, the target area here, then the first magnet is a blue thing here. The other magnets are, are the, other, the other magnets are those, those red things. The blue frames that you see there and there are the frames that hold the drift chambers and the, um, the, uh, the, the silver frames are the frames that uh, hold the, the shower counters for, for neutrals. Um, the target is an active target that can measure the path traveled by the particles that are produced. And so we could measure the lifetimes of the particle. In fact, the main results of the experiment was the measurement of the lifetimes of a number of charmed particles, the charged D mesons, the uh, D plus and D minus, the uh, neutral D mesons, the D zero, and the lambda C uh, baryon, the char uh, charmed baryon. So these were the, um, the most important uh, physics results, but there were also a number of, uh, of, technical, of technical developments uh, during, made during the, the, the uh, design and construction of, of the experiment uh, in the area of uh, detectors, silicon detectors, drift chambers, and digital electronics. And for example, things that were done at the time to uh, build the, the silicon detectors that were used for the target were actually the beginning of the development of the, the high precision uh, silicon uh, trackers that we see today in the experiments at LHC, for example. Some of the people are actually the same that work on, on that, on that uh, experiment at that time. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the timeline of the experiment as I tried to reconstruct it from the documents that I managed to, to find. So it starts in 1973 and goes on until about 1987, so it's about 15 years. And uh, it's, uh, there, there, there was a first uh, important run, data taking run at the beginning of 1980. And the data from this run were used to uh, measure the uh, charge D lifetime. And the second run, important run, was between 83 and 84. And the data from this run were used to measure the D0 lifetime and uh, the lambda C lifetime. And then the target, as I will show you, it's slightly different. Uh, in, the, in between, there was the NA7 experiment that we'll hear about in the next talk, I guess. And uh, the, uh, the, the SPS, the SPS uh, was run as a collider for the UA1 and the UA2 experiments. So let's start from the beginning, from the, beginning, uh, from the uh, letter of intent. So this is the letter of intent from 1973, and it is in Lorenzo's handwriting. At that time, you did not use computers to, to write documents. You would write them on paper, and then you take the paper, you hand it to a typist or a secretary, and they will format it nicely, nicely for you. And, and that's what you see in the next slide. Um, so this, uh, this thing is, is from 1973, and uh, it's called uh, uh, Comparative Study of Hadron Fragmentation at the SPS. 
So there's no mention of photo production here, and we'll see that this will change at some point. And what is uh, remarkable, I think, here is that, okay, there are, we have 31 names in, the, in this uh, letter of intent from four institutions, Roma, Frascati, Milano, and Pisa. And what is remarkable is that I think this is the only instance of an experiment approved that, that would be approved at CERN that is where the collaboration is made only by Italians, okay? For good and bad, but whatever. Okay, so what, these are some uh, paragraphs from that document that I will show you, but mainly what was the physics program? The physics program was basically take some beam of hadrons, like with pions, kaons, protons, whatever, and you know, strike it on a target and measure whatever comes out, and measure the distribution okay, of, of, of whatever comes out. And you see this, again, in uh, Lorenzo, his right, handwriting here, and he say that we use beams made of uh, pions, kaons, and protons. Uh, and uh, what uh, is remarkable here is that actually he mentions the possibility of a tagged photon beam which is, you know, that's what will actually happen in the future. I don't know the idea how I got the idea there at that time. And comparative study, because the idea was to measure these distributions of the products of the reaction and compare it for different incident particles. That was the idea, whatever it was. So this is the very first uh, drawing of the experiment layout as a string of magnet. And the basic idea was that you have a string of magnet so that the higher momentum particles will traverse more magnets, will traverse more magnetic fields, so that the, the momentum resolution was kind of balanced, of uniform across the whole, the whole momentum, momentum range. Okay, so from the uh, letter of intent, we go to the proposal. Uh, nothing is actually changed from the proposal. The title is the same, it's just about six months later and uh, the detector is the same. There is only a little bit more detail about describing how the detector would, would look like and what the physics program would be. And there is a first mention of actually using drift chambers for, 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 for the, the chambers. And for that time, the drift chambers were, were, were quite new. I mean, something that were invented just a uh, short time before. And then there's some mention about Photon detectors uh, made of uh, lead glass and uh, lead glass blocks and uh, lead scintillator sandwiches, and a, a more de more detail in the physics program. But still, it's a completely hadronic physics program with you see, oops, multiparticle production on hydrogen and multiparticle production on nuclei, elastic, elastic scattering. It's all uh, very wide and completely hadronic. So next, we have the, the addendum number two. Addendum number one was a trivial correction of a mistake that was made. So the, the addendum number two in 74, again, um, again we have a layout, but this is slightly changed because here uh, an important point of this document, it was following a specific request from the SPS committee which was that we needed to show to the committee that we are able to do pattern recognition and reconstruct the tracks in the spectrometer. That was not an easy task when you have many particles in the final state. And so I remember a, quite a large effort that we did at that time to write the code for do the pattern recognition, test it on Monte Carlo events to sh and you know, see what the efficiency we got. And the, one of the results of this effort was that more chambers were added, and a third stack of chambers was added in the middle with respect to the proposal, and that would help the pattern recognition, which still was kind of, of marginal. And uh, then in November 74, of course, we had the discovery of the JSI, charm is discovered, and so everything changed. Everything changed at that point. And if you go and see the next addendum, which is addendum number three, you see that, this, this is from 76, you see that now the title is changed. Yes, it's a status report of NA1, but it's a proposal for the determination of the ETA-C lifetime, 
we had a Primakov effect. So here, three things have changed at the same time. Now the beam is not hadrons, but it's photons. Now we're not looking at generic distribution. We are look, want to look at the specific particle produced. And the other one is that we want to measure the lifetime of this particle. So it's a big change you know, from a very wide and somewhat vague physics program to a very specific single process with a specific quantity we want to measure. A huge change in, 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 in perspective. So yes, the Primakov effect, you have a photon, a photon, uh, let me move this a little bit far away. Yeah. A photon, a high energy photon, changes a photon with the nucleus and creates a lambda C, exactly as for the pi zero. The same, the same process. That, that was the idea. And of course it was changed uh, after a while. You see that. So from, uh, after addendum three, number three, actually, the experiment was approved. And we had to build it. And we built it. Right? We built it. We, we uh, installed it at CERN and commissioned it. And I personally spent two years in 1997, 1997, 1999, and 1979 there at CERN you know, for the installation of the experiment. I was, I was personally in charge of the trigger uh, and, uh, and the data acquisition of the of the experiment. And finally, in 1979, we have a status report to the SPSC where we want to tell the SPSC that we are ready. We are ready to take data. This is what we say in this, uh, in this report. Basically, we say we are ready. And we have a description of actually the final, basically the final configuration of the experiment, the, the uh, vertex detector, uh, the drift chambers, uh, with the delay lines to use to measure the second coordinate, and the photon detectors with lead glass blocks, Cherenkov counters in the, inside the magnets to distinguish kaons from pions. But what's mostly important is that here, in this document, we have the first, at least the first official mention of the fact that we want to measure the lifetime of charmed, of charmed and we want to do that with a special target done with uh, 40 layers of thin silicon detectors to measure the charge multiplicity and see the steps in charge multiplicity that are caused by the decay of the mesons. And so measure the decay path and from that derive the lifetime of these particles. So, so then we, here there was actually a run where we took about 1.8 million events with that configuration of the target. And uh, the, here we have now, uh, again, a report to the SPSC where we, we show that we've done a preliminary analysis on those data and that we see, we see that, you see, evidence for DD bar diffractive production. We see that there actually are D mesons in our data. Let me skip this. It describes the target. And this is the target. This, this is the active target made, made of silicon layers. And these are examples of what you get when a particle decays inside the target. Okay, it made, it's made somewhere here, then it travels, then it decays, and you see a jump in, in the pulse site, which corresponds to a jump in charge multiplicity that you have. You have one jump here, you have two jumps there. And this is how we measure the lifetimes. And this is... This is, our, that is the, display, the display of four, the event display on four events, where you see the tracks as detected by the spectrometers, charged and neutral, and what is, you see in the target, the corresponding, in the corresponding event, what we see in the target. And here, you see again Lorenzo's handwriting. This is Lorenzo's handwriting with a description of what this was. My problem with this, sorry. The description of what this, this, this was, right? The process, the particular process that happened and how it matched what we see in the spectrometer matched what we see in the target. So this is our um, mass spectrum where you see excess in the right places. And uh, the conclusion is, is that we are ready to take data. We see, we see uh, the Chan meson and we are ready to take data. I mean, we are ready to analyze the data. We are, this is a preliminary analysis and we are working to a final version of the analysis. In the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, while we are analyzing this data, we already have a proposal 
we already have a proposal for a, an improved, an improved target. Right? And the improved target is now a monolithic crystal with thin electrodes. See here, thin electrodes printed on the upper surface. It's a, it's a crystal. It's a Germanium crystal. It's a Germanium. With thin electrodes on the upper surface, on top of the beam. This gave us a, a resolution, special resolution of 100 micron instead of the 400 microns of the, uh, the previous target, and so it allowed us to go to gain a factor four in the resolution, in the time resolution for the measurement of the lifetime, which was needed to measure the lifetime of the, the, D, of the neutral D, which, was, which has a smaller, much smaller lifetime. Okay, so this is again, again a description of the same target, it's a little better. Now it's a sub subsequent document where you have more details on how the electrodes are done, what the pulse site of different multiplicities, and then the actual layout of the target with the crystal, with the germanium crystal here, and then with, uh, again, silicon, silicon layers uh, after, after that. And then, so uh, the, the final analysis of uh, the data taken in that run, it's, uh, um, we published a paper, this is the paper, published on the lifetime of the, of the, the charge D mesons, and uh, you see a mass plot where you show the excess for the D and the D star. You have uh, the steps in the target and the, uh, the uh, time plot, the lifetime plot with the fit and the value obtained by, by the measurement, which is this one here. All right. Then in 19... Then in 1982, we, in, this, uh, in this document, this preprint, we claim the evidence for the production of the F meson. The F meson is the, uh, a meson where you have a, a charmed quark and an S quark. And it's, today it's known as the, the D plus, the this abyss. The this abyss, right, this is, 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 uh, is charged. And at that time it was not established yet. So we, we produced couple of mass plots in two different channels, and we saw an excess in both of them about the same, the same mass. And so we claimed this was, was evidence for the bis S. Actually, this, this result was never, never published. Okay. Right. Then what? Oh, then we had the, the, the second run here in, in between 1983 and 1984. And from those data, we got the measurement of the D0 lifetime with a new target. This is the paper, and this is now the, the, mass, the mass of the D0 here and the mass of the D star, because some, many of the Ds, actually, the D0 actually came from the decay of the D star, and pi on plus a D0. And, uh, and this is a drawing of the target with the monolithic target, germanium target in front, and the different uh, silicon layers. Uh, there, the steps, the charge steps, the typical event, the charge steps in the, in the target, and the time, the, the time plot, and the uh, result of the fit. If you look at the PDG today, of course, there is a very, a very precise, we know that number, very much precision there, and if you compare with that, you see that it's, it's perfectly compatible. All right. And the last one that we published, very close in time actually, with the zero lifetime, is the lifetime of the lambda C, the baryon with, 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 with the C quark. Uh, this is the paper here. Uh, and okay, these are the, the mass plots that shows the excess at the right mass in four different uh, selection with four different selection criteria. And then you have here the, the, the time plot here, the steps in the target and the value of the lifetime that we measure. All right, that's it. But you know, I was looking for pictures. You know, unfortunately, there are not many because at that time we didn't have cell phones. So not many pictures are available. And I think some friends send, sent me some. Uh, so we have what we have. Actually, I think the best picture of, of the, of the uh, actual experiment is this one that I likely found. I was sure 
showed, showed this already. This is a nice picture that shows the whole, the whole layout of the experiment. And then there, there is, uh, this is uh, people working at, uh, in the target area. And I think I recognize a young uh, Marcello. I think it's Marcello. Is he a Marcello? No, no, it's not here yet. He was here at this morning. Uh, and uh, see again, the target area. And this is a hydrogen target with a young Angelo Scrivano there. And I, I'm not sure if this was the beginning of, uh, of anyone when we still had an hydrogen target, or it was afterwards when, when we used that for MSF. Hmm? It was N7, right? Yeah. But it was so nice, this picture, I couldn't resist, sure. And this is a nice group of people that uh, uh, Gigi gave me. I think you should be able to recognize most of them. Uh, they are here. Many of these are here. OK. Anyway. And this is me with, with Lorenzo. I'm not, I'm not changed, right? I'm not changed much. <laughs> And I, this, this, exactly. I, I was wearing a wig. And, it's, uh, and uh, it was a break in a conference in France. I went to Lorenzo. And I wish I remember what he was trying to explain to me, but he obviously was trying to explain something. Don't, I don't remember. So I'm getting close to the end. And I, before closing, I just want to say one thing. I think that uh, Fram was. Uh, a very important experience, professional experience from many of us. Some people are here, so they know what I'm, what I'm meaning. But it was also a very important human experience. Friendship were born there, and we're still, we're still alive today. And uh, I learned, personally learned a lot from those years. And the things that I learned about triggering, about doing pattern recognition for tracks, through magnetic field, all those things had a very profound influence on everything I did for the rest of my career. And I think that was thanks to the particular way that Lorenzo was running the collaboration. He was the leader. He was the unquestioned leader of the collaboration. But he led the group with a light hand, with a lot of respect and appreciation for the ideas of everybody, including people very young, like I was at that time. So that's it. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you, Luciano. Now we have Graham Beck about Lorenzo and NA7. First, let me say what an honor and delight it was to be invited to give this talk, even in spite of the, the sad reasons for it. Um, so uh, I don't know how long it's going to take, so I'll ask Francesco to stop me if I get five minutes. Thank yeah, thank you very much. Uh, because there used to be a rule which, when I started writing these slides, I, uh, I made a note to myself that Lorenzo taught me um, early on that uh, the rule was two minutes per slide, but you know I'm getting older and I, I'm not quite sure if it's the other way around, is it two slides per minute? So I just, <laughs> I just carry on until I've run out of something to say. Um, so the, uh, the NA7 experiment was all about understanding the pi meson. And the pi on uh, is, is of particular interest because it's the lightest strongly interacting particle. And it's, we suppose it to be made of just one light quark and one light antiquark, a U and a D, or a U and a D bar, or a D bar and a U. This is for the charged pion. And it was discovered 
the year I was born, actually, in 1947, in uh, cosmic ray experiments, and it's produced very easily at accelerators. And so a fairly natural question is, how big is it? Now, ideally, what you like to do is shine a torch on it, or, because it's such a small object, maybe shine an electron microscope on it. So you'd like to throw electrons at charged pions and measure how they're scattered. And that was the principle of how Bob Hofstadter uh, measured the size of the proton back in the 1950s. And he did, did that in some detail and won a share of the Nobel Prize in 1961 for that. So we'd like to do a similar thing, um, but there is a snag, which is that Hofstadter could prepare his target and go away for a coffee and come back and it would still be there. We can't make a target of pions because they live only for a very short time, about 26 nanoseconds. So the coffee would have to be a really espresso espresso if you wanted to do it that way around. Um, so that really wasn't possible until the CERN SPS was being built and we understood that you could make high energy beams of pions, 300 GeV, and throw the pion beam at electrons at rest, which is just doing the experiment the same, the, the other way around, pions on electrons rather than electrons on pions. Um, and the downside really is that if you, if you take a 300 GeV pion um, and an electron at rest, and then you, you imagine what it's like running along, picking up the Fram spectrometer and run, running along with the pion, so the pion seems to be at rest, then you're, you're hitting an electron with one GeV, which is pretty much the energy that Hofstadter used to measure the proton charge radius. So uh, I, I would like to explain this diagram a little bit. It's, it's just a summary of um, what, I, uh, what I've been saying, but I, I, I realize that we have some very honored guests here who are not physicists, but this is not really so difficult if you will bear with me. Um, if, if you imagine um, time moving from left to right, then you start with an electron and a pion. Uh, you make them approach each other, and the electron exchanges a photon with the pion. You know very well um, the, the dynamics of this, uh, this part, the electron-photon part. But the, the photon probes the pion, essentially, so you learn about the pion, um, how big it is, what sort of structure it has from that, that interaction. So, pion and electron coming in in some way, elas elastic scattering, pion electron going out, um, and in our case, the electron is at rest in a hydrogen target, and the beam is 300 GeV pion beam. So, that's what we wanted to measure, and uh, it was my boss at Southampton University in England um, who wanted to uh, propose this. Uh, so I did some calculations and some drawings for him and we both came to CERN to chat to the SPS committee about it. And we asked CERN for, um, for not very much. We asked for the 300 GeV pion beam and by the way we'd like to look at some kaons as well because they're interesting. And we asked for a, uh, a rather special liquid hydrogen target a quite powerful spectrometer magnet and some electron and photon detectors and a few other things and we built a few tracking detectors. And we had a very pleasant, uh, relaxed conversation with the chairman of the SPSC, Bjorn Wieck, uh, who said that the physics aims look good but we're asking a lot. And he said that as he understood things, the first approved experiment for the uh, North Area at the SPS the Fram spectrometer experiment, already had a lot of that stuff. So he advised us to go and chat to Fram and see if we could collaborate. Um, has anybody said so far, because Roberto wanted me to say this morning, that Fram actually is short for Frame, Frametazione, yeah? Yeah, so Fram, because for many years I tried figuring out FRA was obviously Frascati and Milano, and uh, where was Pisa? <laughs> Um, so, 
When we looked at their proposal, the description of, with these four magnets and the shower detectors, it was kind of beyond our wildest dreams. It was far better apparatus than we were thinking of asking for in any case. So that was, that was the start of a run of good luck. And then we needed some collaborators, some, some UK collaborators. And Steve started phoning around. And then when he got to as far as Westfield College and spoke to Ted Bellamy, Ted Bellamy didn't need asking twice. He really wanted to, uh, to come and work again with people like Lorenzo and, then, and, and Giorgio. Giorgio, he knew from... Well, in the past, as you've heard. So we had a meeting of UK people and Lorenzo, the first time I met Lorenzo at CERN in 74. And then uh, I think Aldo was there. I'm not absolutely sure. Emanuela was there, maybe Roberto. Anyway, uh, the details were discussed um, and we decided it would, it would work. And I was, then, I was invited to Pisa for a fortnight to learn uh, about the Monte Carlo and reconstruction programs that were being written there. And for me, that was a really big event. I was quite scared. I think it was the first time I actually left. I, first time I had to leave the UK to actually do some work abroad. And of course, I didn't speak any Italian, so I was, uh, I was a bit anxious about this trip. But, uh, so in November 1974, I went to Pisa, and of course, I was very well looked after by everybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So I have a few, uh, not a lot of detailed memories, but a few vivid snapshots. Um, for instance, when I arrived, I came to this building, I uh, had a chat to Lorenzo, and he fixed me up with the hotel. He drove me down to the Hotel Victoria and made, me, uh, made sure that I was okay with that. And then I was invited to have dinner with his family. And I have a very, very vivid snapshot of that. Because I remember sitting at the, the end of a table, dining table, and over there there was a playpen with a small child in it. And to my left was a young lady called Oliver, a delightful young lady. Is that? There we are, there we are. <laughs> Quite a young lady, I should say. <laughs> some way off being a teenager, um, but Oliver spoke um, some English, pretty good English, I spoke no Italian. So we had great fun having a conversation, I remember. Um, yes, and um, that broke the ice, that was really quite fun. And I remember being asked questions like, was I married? No. <laughs> did I have a girlfriend? Yes. What did she do? Yes. <laughs> These were all quite easy questions to answer. And then I think the last question you asked me was, were we going to get married? And that was, uh, that was a more difficult one. But it was, uh, it was really nice, really nice setting. And the, the, the next memory I have is of sitting in the old physics building, working with Ennio Bertolucci on the Monte Carlo for the first week, and Aldo Mencione for the second week on the reconstruction. And they both looked after me very well. Um, I should press on a bit, actually. The, there was a big interruption. Um, Lorenzo came hurrying in one afternoon during the siesta time and said, a new particle has been discovered, they think it's charmonium, and this was the Jabe Psi, of course. Um, and it was discovered again a couple of years later at Frascati, a couple of days later at Frascati, I remember. Um, and uh, soon afterwards, uh, we heard that uh, Professor, Professore Manelli, with two ends, was going to give us a seminar about it. So we all piled into cars and drove out to San, the new lab at San Piero and sat in the seminar room. And then the news came through that uh, Italo had, had, had an accident on the way out from Pisa. So we all piled back into cars and went back to have a look and see what was going on. It, it didn't seem to be too serious, I think. But that's the first time I remember... Oh, dear, I'm pressing the wrong button again. That's the first time I remember... Um, Italo, and uh, that's about what he looked like in those days. Um, anyway, so we got back to San Piero, and Italo started telling us all about the Jabe Psi discovery and what it meant in Italian. And after a couple of sent the, the, the room was crowded with, with lots of young Italian physicists. And after a couple of sentences, Lorenzo stopped him and said, excuse me, professor, we have an English guest. And I looked around and I thought, what English guest? It's me. 
And it alone stopped and said, um, oh, I'm sorry. And he started from the beginning again and gave the whole seminar in English. So um, I, hope that, I hope the young Italian guys didn't mind too much. <laughs> anyway, that was 74. So I returned to the UK and did some computing from uh, Enyo and Aldo's programs, which was very useful. And we had to learn how to build the things we needed for the vertex detector. Some fine scintillator hodoscopes and some multi-wire chambers, which was, which was my responsibility. And the experiment to measure the pion form factor, to find the size of the pion, was approved in uh, 77. And in 78, we moved out to CERN. And we spent two years, quite productive years, actually, um, proving that our apparatus worked and finding some of the events, but without the spectrometer. And then in 1980, we moved into the... Um, oh well. We moved in, in front of the spectrometer. These were the people uh, whose names I've grabbed from our publications. I do apologize if I've missed anybody out. It was a really friendly collaboration, um, and I was proud to belong to it. The first name on the list was <coughs> Roberto Amendolia, who, who worked really hard on it. Um, so all our publications are Amendolia et al. And all I can say about that is that they've been cited a lot, so Roberto should have really taken out some kind of royalty agreement on the use of his name, and he would have done quite well, I think. Um, so that, that was NA7, 57 of us, but uh, we, we had other commitments, so sometimes we were short of, of shift people. And then uh, we expanded our program quite a lot, and uh, it was extended uh, to be NA29. And uh, uh, this included people from Clermont-Ferrand and uh, Milan and Laura here, who did a lot on the analysis, is here today. It's nice to see her again. Now, so here is the picture that you've seen um, from Luciano to some extent. This is a spectrometer, and what we put in front of it was uh, multi-wire chambers, scintillation counter hodoscopes, and a liquid hydrogen target. And I've sketched on here a pi minus coming in and ejecting an electron from the target pi minus carries on to the end of the spectrometer and the electron is bent round and uh, leaves a, a big shower signal in the shower counters here. Um, we, we were given, well we reckoned we needed 24 days to make the transition from NA, move out the vertex of NA1 and move in um, the NA7 stuff. Um, 24 days um, was about what we got and uh, so this is one of my favorite quotations. Um, uh, and we have plenty of not quite enough of, uh, not quite enough time. But it worked, and uh, it largely worked because Lorenzo was directing and saying what should be done when, and we got there, we got there. Um, there were some major adjustments, semi-major adjustments to the spectrometer. The aperture had to be opened out somewhat, and that needed dealing with fairly diplomatically. And we had some innovations too. Our multi-wire chambers um, saw, uh, the, some of the wires in the multi-wire chambers, of course, uh, saw the beam. And we were after a very high beam rate. So we had to use electronics, which, which couldn't wait very long. So we, we built uh, an electronics, um, a cage full of electronics down here. And when we got a, a loose trigger signal, we captured the multi-wire chamber outputs and said, stop the experiment until the rest of the electronics in the barrack has uh, confirmed the trigger. Um, and so we had a two-layer um, trigger um, structure, which was new to quite a lot of people. So. Um, that took a bit of getting used to, but I, I think we le all learned to live with that. And there was some barrack etiquette to be learned. So here's one of my most, my favorite pictures. Um, 
of the barrack um, and a few things, a few features of the barrack. Um, this was a good place to sit. Um, the experiment was out here together with the, the magic gas mixers for the chambers, um, which uh, this, this stuff was, the, the gas that had to flow into the chambers was flammable and it was toxic and it was narcotic. It was not very nice stuff. Although I don't remember anybody ever getting high on it, to be quite honest. Um, at the other end of the bar far end of the barrack were two PDP-1145 computers, which were very noisy, so that was not a place to be. And another place not to be was um, near the coffee table at this end, because that, that, the Italians have one of these machines. It's a piece of apparatus I've never learned to operate uh, properly. <laughs> Um, and it exploded at least twice, as far as I remember. Horrible device. Uh, the, the seats were comfortable. Uh, you could line up four chairs, and I didn't try it myself, but I know somebody who, who lined up four chairs and slept through a night shift. And then I won't talk about the magic boxes. They were, they were black boxes to us. We, we didn't really understand how they worked. But we checked them out. They seemed to work okay in the end, and they were beautiful beautiful shade of red, I remember, after all. So, now, more serious things. Here are the tools of the trade. Uh, a screwdriver, which you need to fix most things that can be fixed. Um, a coffee cup to keep you awake when, uh, when you're flagging. And for the very relaxed moments, or the very desperate moments when you're tearing your hair out, you need a smoke, so there's an ashtray, and that's about it. Um, but it reminds me of uh, the first night shift that I ran with Lorenzo when we'd, we'd checked out things for an hour and we got to the relaxing moment and Lorenzo, Lorenzo pulled out his pack of cigarettes and I thought, great, now I can have a smoke. So I, I pulled out my pipe and my tobacco and my lighter and Lorenzo froze and he looked down at the table and he said, you have a black cigarette lighter? I said, yes. And he said, you must never buy a black cigarette lighter. All the black cigarette, cigarette lighters in the barrack belong to me. So <laughs> there was clearly an issue with, with, uh, with cigarette lighters. Um, and ever since, when, when I go and buy a lighter from the supermarket, they say, what color do you want? I say, I don't mind, as long as it's not black. You know, so. um, Okay, so we collected, we, we looked at more things, we collected more data than we originally aimed to. This was in about mid-1980 to mid-1982. Um, and we had, we had problems, we had electronics breaking and chambers breaking, all the usual things. Um, and then, oh, power glitches. If you had to change, in the middle of the night, a, a power supply on the back of a crate, that was particularly dangerous actually um, because you, would, you had to go behind the electronics rack and you had to be careful not to tread on the cables and then you had to open this latching mechanism that they had on the back of the Kamak crates and pull out this really heavy power supply with sharp corners. So you, you either broke a fingernail or dropped a crate on your foot and then you had to go and get another one and put it back. It was not very nice. That um, oh! At one stage, our trigger rate started falling and um, we couldn't explain it. So we went into the beam line and checked out to check out the, the photomultiplier tubes. And I remember we unscrewed the, the cover on the base of a photomultiplier and pulled it out. And this high voltage resistor chain at the bottom was completely um, jam packed with dead moths and wasps and stuff like that. So we, we blew them out, put the cover back on, and started off and it worked perfectly. So, um, I don't know how they got in there. The holes were very small. But, you know. um, oh, and then, then there was a really big problem once when um, we had a, a counter with a photo, with a photo multiplier on, on each side. And we were seeing, I was reminded last night, that we were seeing... Um, an asymmetry between the counts from these, these two photomultipliers. And we, it was intermittent. The problem was there some days, but not others. And I remember spending a couple of days staring down an oscilloscope, particularly with, with P.O. Peaky, actually, trying to figure out what was going wrong. 
Um, and Ted Bellamy and Phil March had a go as well. And then uh, we had a new young student, Pierre Simone Marchese, who, who came in and uh, overheard what was going on and said, uh, have you checked to see if there are stray magnetic fields um, on this, this side, which was counting low. And uh, it was discovered that, in fact, um, a new experiment, the European Hybrid Spectrometer, had started up next door. Um, and that, was, that had a big, a powerful magnet. And when they, when they were running, um, it affected our photomultipliers. So that was quite an easy one to solve, but quite a, a, you know, a neat discovery. Um, detectors catching fire happened once, at least. The, the rapid cy cycling bubble chamber caught fire, I think, while Lorenzo and I were on shift. So we, we had to move out of the hall. But, uh, just a little bit of excitement. Um, so, uh, analysis started in 1980 as soon as we got some data, and it took the best part of five years to analyze everything. Uh, there was a lot to do offline, understanding in detail how the, what the detectors were really telling us, and uh, finding the events we wanted, understanding what the backgrounds were, and the corrections. So, so this is one of our analysis meetings, and the people are fairly obviously, well, that's me, a younger version. <coughs> Lorenzo, Emanuela Moroni, Laura Parasso, that's the only photo I have of Laura. Um, there's one later that, where she was the, the camera woman, um, but she's not in that photo. And Giovanni, uh, Giovanni Battignani. Um, so, what I will do now is very rapidly, because I'm sure it will be quite boring to some people, is to, to go through these channels that we measured, starting with the one I, I understand least well, um, because it's, it's a little bit complicated. So this was a measurement of the radiative uh, decay width of the rho, rho resonance. Um, so it's a bit like the diagram I showed you early on, except that instead of having a, an electron target down here, we have a heavy metal nucleus, nuclear target. Oh. Um, and that, that produces the, the strong electromagnetic field, which allows you to make a particle, in this case the rho resonance, and then to observe it decaying, to identifying it, it by observing it decaying into a pi minus and a pi zero. Um, Laura did a lot of the analysis of that, I remember. Um, and so how is that measuring the radiative width? Well, I guess if you, work, if, you, if you run time backwards, you're making a row here, and that's decaying to a pi gamma. I hope I've got that right. But that was, that was a good answer, and that was published. And it, it, the results are still in the particle data group listings. And then we did a kind of funnily very similar thing. This is um, before then with the li liquid hydrogen target. So we were scattering um, pions off electrons. This was our main uh, data sample, but also uh, including looking for the production of uh, an extra pi zero. And um, uh, so the the reaction looks quite similar to the previous one, but it's, at, uh, it's, it's nearer the threshold for producing the pion. And, uh, well, here we have this, this photon, which, which I didn't show the electrons at the bottom here, but we have a photon and a pion making uh, an extra pion. And it turns out that what runs around this, this square in this theoretical argument is the uh, the color quantum uh, quantum the, the color quantum number in QCD? So um, the conclusion of our here here are the um, here are the events we found, and from the rate of production of those events, we included that uh, the data dictates the necessity of three quark colors, which was one of the, one of the first um, observations of that. Um, and now getting nearer to home, um, because this is the same diagram as on the first one I showed you, but turned on its side. 
we used a positron beam scattering off electrons um, to look at the production of, of pi plus and pi minus um, at four different momenta. So these are our results. And that's particularly required for making corrections to another long-running experiment called G minus 2. So from the angles of the tracks in the multi-wire chambers, we saw electron positrons, uh, mu plus, mu minus, and pion production. So that was a nice result. And here we are with the final result. So back to the original diagram, we scatter electrons from pions, and we want to find out how big the pion is. So here are the data, here are our data points after about five years of analysis. Um, they are normalized, that is, uh, they're shown as the ratio of the cross section to a point like pion. If the pion was point like, the line would just be a, vert a horizontal line um, at one. Um, and from, uh, okay, so we, we, got, we got the data points but we, I, we weren't quite sure how to extract the pion charge radius. And at the end of uh, the meeting where we, where we reported these points, I said to Lorenzo, what do we do now? And unfortunately, he said, fit everything in sight. <clears throat> so we spent some more months fitting, looking at 40 or other, so other data sets we, we could combine with and uh, about the same number of theoretical predictions. And eventually we found a really nice theoretical result based on phase shift analysis. So all we had to do was to take that result um, and use it with our data to dictate um, the slope of, of, uh, of the curve at this point. So our data could dictate, um, could wave the curve around as much as it liked. Um, and that gave us an answer for the slope uh, here, which tells you the mean square charge radius. Um, or, well, uh, to put it in uh, another way, the, the root mean square charge radius, or roughly the, the, the size of the uh, pion in terms of its, 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 the radius of its charge distribution. So that's our answer for our best answer for the size of the pion. 0.663 Fermi's plus or minus 1%. Um, analysis of that data, uh, we did rather differently from, the, from previous experiments which were made by a Russian-American collaboration. Um, we were very careful not to cut on the momenta, so we had a very small radiated correction. Um, and we fought for that. We had guys visiting us from that group and they said, you must cut on the momenta, it helps you enormously. Well, it, it doesn't, as it turns out. So we made the right decision there. Um, and, okay, uh, I will show you here just what the results are for the K-on, uh, the K-on charge radius, which is slightly smaller because the, the K-on has heavier quarks. Uh, and there <coughs> are, there's the, the same numbers for the proton. Interestingly, there is, some, uh, there is some problem with the, proton, the measurements of the proton radius at, at the present, just now, in the past three years. Um, I'd like to show you something which didn't get into the paper. Um, this plot, if I turn it round, um, to plot it in a, in a more conventional way. Oh, what's gone wrong here? That's interesting. It's very interesting. Okay. So this is an animation, an animation that's never worked for me. Um, here is, don't worry, here is our data with that fit, just in this small region. Um, if I extend it, this is digging deeper and deeper into the pion, um, and you, so you see a smaller and smaller amount of charge. Um, over in this, this side of the picture, there are some more data nowadays, and it's of particular interest to QCD. In the other direction, if, um, where does it go up to the right? Well, it goes through this row resonance I was talking about. And this is just our fit extrapolated, um, the fit to our data extrapolated through the row resonance and down the other side. 
So when I saw that, I thought, right, okay, this is good. Um, we've got a good answer. Um, so that, that was our data. That was 1986, and here is a, a photo, photos of a few guys from around that time. Luciano, I think, has shown this one. Ah. Yeah. Um, so Lorenzo, Marco Budinic, Giovanni, Emanuela, Pier Simone, Roberto, Margarita, and Roberto. I bet he regrets that one. Um, and here are some of the English. This is in my flat. There's dear old Ted Bellamy, um, Derek, our technician who helped build our multi-wire chambers. He's no longer with us, unfortunately. Myself, I've learned to stop walking around with a little dog on my shoulder. And uh, Mara Landon, who I share an office with now, his hair is now totally grey, and he's uh, one of the, the Atlas uh, calorimeter gurus. So he's done very well. Um, did I say Greg Heath, who, who did a lot of uh, initial work on our radiative correction, is a, is a professor at Bristol University and works on CMS. Now, was there anything else to say? So, when we were making the experiment, we asked the CERN theorists, what can QCD, the theory of the strong interaction, tell us about the pion charge radius? And they said, um, nothing, the, the quarks are too light. Um, we could perhaps calculate it in lattice QCD, which needs a lot of computing power. We don't have that come back in 20 years. So right on cue, 20 years later, 2006, the lattice, one of the two lattice QCD groups produced a result which uh, is very, very close to ours. More importantly, they, they just kept on commenting about the agreement with, with our data um, on its own. Um, and I looked again for this, and in 2012, this is a uh, result um, from uh, of lattice QCD uh, reported in 2012. So the predictions are the black points here, and there are some a few points at high Q squared, but all this data starting from here back here is us. It's referred to as CERN, but CERN in this case is, is Amendelia et al. Um, and, uh, oh, at the end of 2013 there was a dispersion model which, which fitted a model to the time-like data of the Chloe, Babar and other experiments, E plus E minus experiments. And, uh, and what they did, having fitted their, module, mo their, their model, was to say, we, we ex this is the way it extrapolates back to the Amendelea data, and look, it agrees quite well. In fact, we still have the most, the tightest measurements. Yeah. Um, hmm? Is that it? No, no, no. Yeah, pretty much. One more. Yeah. One more. I think. And the, the very last one is that we are of, uh, quite, we are of use to um, the, our data are useful to the hadronic, the, the, correct, the hadronic part of the correction to uh, the muon G minus uh, two measurement. Um, and they, so this is from 2012 again. Ah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so they say, uh, to correct for the lack of precision at threshold energies, the pion form factor is extracted from a parameterization based on chiral perturbation theory. <sighs> um, constrained from space-like data, which again is, uh, is our space-like form factor. And that is, I think, it. I have a few anecdotes which I wouldn't dare to repeat without a drop of wine first. Um, and Finally, just to say, of course, that Lorenzo was the single most important guy in this. He guided everything, um, and he looked after people. 
He, he wrote me job references and, and somehow got me a job with, uh, with the INFN at one, one stage, which was invaluable. Um, so he was, uh, he was a special guy. I don't think he would, I don't think he would uh, mind if I said that I also remember with great affection the, the experts who were guided by him, who were dedicated to the NA1, NA7 and NA29 experiments. And they were a great pleasure to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. So now we have Jacques Lefrançois for Lorenzo and Aleph. have most of my slides to Aleph, but I could not resist to spend at least one slide on our first encounters. Uh, and this first encounter was 47 years ago at a Dubna meeting, uh, where it was the first time I was to, going to Russia. Ah. Louder? Yes. <laughs> I will try. Uh, and. <clears throat> The uh, full Primakov team was there at the meeting, uh, Lorenzo and Carlo Bemparad and Pierluigi Braccini. And I remember very well, I was impressed with the, the physics of the Primakov effect, which they reported. We had the data at that time. It was really beautiful. And uh, I remember also that we visited St. Petersburg, which was Leningrad at the time. Uh, and I remember we were in the same interest group as a flock of uh, cheap, <laughs> guided, and uh, I remember it because I was jealous because uh, Paola was there with uh, Lorenzo, and uh, <laughs> uh, they were obviously enjoying this trip with their friends, and uh, I was a single physicist because my wife had to stay with the baby at home, <laughs> so I, I remember this, this episode. Then we met again a brief later, later around 80, say, because we were neighbor, we were the first occupant of the North area. Lorenzo was uh, leading NA1 and A7, as you've heard, and uh, I was working on the NA3 experiment with Aldo Michelini, which was just to beam aside, and uh, the NA2 was not even in our hall. There was the muon experiment, which was another hall behind, so we were the, the first users of that hall. Uh, okay, so the start of Aleph, uh, Jack uh, Steinberger, with uh, most of his colleagues from CDHS, had gathered a group of physicists from main lab of Europe to try to un understand how to do a good detector for LEP. And that was in the 8081, 80, I think. And uh, PISA was certainly one of the key labs with many high level physicists. Uh, and cl during close to one year, we did something like brainstorming on many different ideas and areas, including uh, a magnet in the shape of a sphere. And this was a very exciting period where we were not cornered on a single part of the detector, but tried to uh, understand uh, in a general way what could be a good detector. Uh, and this is where I learned to appreciate Lorenzo, where we had a very good understanding, but a very open mind. And he was part of the sphere group with Jack Steinberger while I was working on the solenoid with René Turlet, Michel Davier, Henri Vido, and the other. And uh, so the fun of the brainstorming had to stop at some time. And uh, we settled on a rough initial design, share responsibility, and then look more on a, a single uh, detector. And uh, for Lorenzo, it was the HCAL. And in a book we produce, which is 25 years of Aleph, there's an article written by Lorenzo called The Inception of ACOL, where he described the main idea to have a good hadronic colorimeter. And the first line is really that it had to have high granularity. This is something which was general in Aleph. I mean, our TPC gave us point in space. 
with good granularity, or e cloud was built with a good granularity, and the argument for the A cloud was the same. It had to have a good hermeticity with the constraint of using the iron, and it has to be as cheap as possible. That's is uh, uh, the, what he writes down in the book. Now, I, from this, I, I, it is stated also that the energy resolution is not the most important parameter. This meant that more or less clearly, the fact that uh, we need to measure, we, we can measure energy only roughly in h cal because anyhow, charged particles are measured by the TPC and photons by e cal, and so there's not much energy left in h cal to be measured. Uh, however, the granularity is essential to f allow to identify the neutral hadron interaction in HK and to track the muons in the jet environment, and I will show an example of that later. Now, the first idea, uh, a bit after the initial brainstorming, was to use scintillators. That was the influence of the CDF experiment planned at, in the US, but the granularity was very hard to get, and the, the idea of using streamer tube, which were similar to tube used in a proton decay experiment, which was being built at Frascati, was explored and uh, adopted. Uh, of course, the granularity meant a huge number of digital, digital channels, one per tube. I don't have the exact number, I will ask, but uh, uh, it was enormous. Okay? So uh, you can also form pads with induced cathode readout, which regroups a certain number of tube over a a small region along the tube. So the Italian group, which initially was uh, Pisa with Lorenzo, Frascati with Paolo Lorelli, and Bari with uh, Marcello Maggi, I believe, were um, uh, uh, so, so, so they started with the three initial group, but then it got enlarged after, and they took responsibility for building the HCAL. Uh, with uh, Lorenzo having the overall leadership. But Jack was always trying to persuade us to uh, reduce the number of different techniques so we would have a, a detector as simple as possible. I mean, for example, the, the luminosity monitor is built in the same, was built in the same way as the ECAL uh, module so that you could learn from each other and not uh, reinvent the wheel each time. And uh, therefore, it was natural when we discussed a muon detector outside of the iron. Uh, Jack said, why well, don't you do it the same way as the HCAL and using the same technique? And then, uh, then of course, this meant that we, uh, the, the HCAL group has also to worry about muon detector. But the strength of the group was not sufficient to handle the construction of HCAL and both muon chambers layer. And, uh, in each muon layer, you have to have tubes in two orthogonal directions, so uh, it started to be very difficult. But Jack succeeded in convincing a Chinese uh, IHEP uh, group to join the Aleph and take responsibility for the second layer of muon chamber. And this started a fruitful collaboration to exchange techniques, and both parties were very satisfied the way it was done and it, how it worked and uh, Lorenzo visited High Hep in 85. Uh, Pisa was also invested in Delica, the design of a silicon strip, but I will discuss later because this uh, was postponed. Uh, so what is the HCAL construction? So you see the, uh, the size of the iron compared to human being, and uh, you had to insert tubes in all the slot inside and you have on the side, uh, on the right side, a uh, layer of muon chambers, uh, uh, each with tubes, and then you see electronics coming out everywhere. Now, what was specific to this is, apart from the fact, the difficulty of building the detector, installing the detector was an enormous work, because uh, for the TPC, you can build a TPC, install the TPC. For ECAL module, you have okay, six ECAL module, and you install six ECAL modules here, you had to insert each one of the little uh, the, uh, inside the HCAL on site. So it was uh, a lot of work on site. And uh, finally, famous picture that you've seen this morning. Uh, uh, 
that was Aleph before the final cabling, but the detectors were already there. You see the bit of the TPC, the ECAL module, and then the HCAL with the tubes inside. Uh, and one day, uh, I think it's in early 89, but I didn't find the date exactly for that picture. Uh, Jack took Pierre Lazeras, our technical coordinator, to the pit, and the two tech spokesmen to be elected in 1993 for a picture at the pit. And from this, you can uh, imagine that you, you could say that uh, early 89, uh, Jack knew in advance uh, all the elections in Aleph for the next <laughs> four years, which is probably correct. <laughs> that was the style of Aleph. <laughs> and, uh, that just to show you how, how, you know, this instrument was a nice design. You see a, a picture of an event uh, with the tracks in the TPC, the energy in the ECAL, and the red part is the HCAL. And there's one little white dot which has, uh, I don't know, uh, here I believe. Yeah. You will see some noise, I believe. There's a little white dot which you may not see well, but along the tracks you see the white dot giving the points on the track and you see very nicely a muon and on the other side, the other side you have a tau tau and one goes to one muon and the other side you have five pions with some energy in h uh, That's another example which is more telling on the, how useful the h can be for muon uh, identification. Uh, where you have uh, uh, Z0 going to 2B, and it's the decay similar apotonically to muon, and it's an oscillation, it's in the B, since both muons are positive. And uh, one can see that with the granularity of HCAL, uh, oops, sorry, I think here, I hope you can see, uh, you see the white dot uh, allowing to follow the track. Uh, no, that was the other one above. Uh, inside the h -cal. So we could identify muons even when they had, did not have enough energy to go outside of the iron, just following the track inside. So that was the, the idea of the granularity, which was written uh, and inside the idea of Lorenzo, how to build the good detector. This is how it paid. Uh, so, uh, Aleph startup, and I've showed our first event, which we received in August 14, and, uh, and that was in the pilot run. We didn't get many events, uh, I think four or five. Uh, and I remember our excitement, everybody who had worked so many years to, uh, uh, seven years to, to build the detector, and we got our first event there. But I remember that at the initial running revealed some difficulties on pit organization, I would say in a discreet way, and a certain number of, uh, of us, uh, I mean senior people, uh, met at the pit and discussed how to change things. And I remember the loan of Lorenzo with his experience, his cow, his dedication. They were very good people, they were Klaus Tittel, uh, Peter Dornant, and uh, I think Gigi was promoted to the name of senior physicist for the occasion. <laughs> it was part of the discussion, Dieter Schlatter, DeVito, and we were sitting on a table, and how can we arrange this so that we, our beautiful instrument really takes data correctly. And uh, we agreed on some change uh, in organization which were implemented, and uh, after that, running went very, very smoothly. And uh, there was a price to pay for that because the senior physicists who had pushed for the, uh, <laughs> the solution should do two weeks uh, in rotation uh, to be fully available to be at the pit as the name of run coordinator. I, went, I think it was important that all the experts had somebody who was looking at the overall picture. And it was important for the experiment to show that this was an essential part of our life, taking the data, and the most experienced physicists had to spend some of their time to be there. And so that was, uh, I think, very, very important. And uh, I found some uh, 
Lawrence would get quite a few of those, and just to show his handwriting. Uh, after the two weeks, you had to come in front of the collaboration and uh, give uh, how it had happened. So you have one first slide where he gave the list, and I will. I did not bore bore you with all the details, but all the things that he was going to say that. You know, everything which was not perfect was pinned down and uh, how we can improve things and uh, how, what has happened and so on. You're reporting to the collaboration. So, 1990, 1993, I became spokesman in February 90, and Lorenzo was enjoying the physics with his brilliant young physicist, and I will give some examples uh, with B physics, with Roberto Tancini and Problem, and Tal Lifetown with Francesco and colleagues. Uh, However, hardware investment was not over, and I will discuss about that also. Uh, first, the physics with uh, HCAL, uh, the B quark asymmetry. Uh, when you have Z0 going to a B, there's a forward-backward asymmetry, which is linked to the measurement of sine squared theta W, and you do that by looking at semileptonic decay of the B with uh, electron and muon leptonic decay. And uh, in uh, 91, I think with the, yes, 1990 and 89 and 90 data, well, actually mostly 90 data, uh, you see that we had a sine squared theta W which had an error which was already better than uh, any neutrino experiment, uh, which had typically 0 0.005. So this was already very important, and uh, after the all the time at the Z0, uh, you, I've given the error on AFB, which is the curve to the right, where you see the, uh, that the error bar have shrink enormously, and you see a very nice curve giving the AFB. And uh, you get the, the accuracy of sine squared theta W, and as everybody knows, there's a tension between what we, sine squared theta W that we get from the BDK and sine squared theta W that you get from other measurement, uh, the style of ADR or from the tau physics. So, uh, now the vertex detector. The idea of the vertex detector was suggested early in 82 by Marcello Giorgi, it's there, and postponed because we had many things to do and we perhaps didn't believe that it was ready or so on. And it, then in 84, there was a suggestion from Ron Settles in Munich to Lorenzo that maybe you could collaborate to join effort to building the vertex detector. And Lorenzo accepted, and the effort started. And, uh, but of course, it had started with some delay, and it was a difficult technique because they wanted to read the two coordinates on the two sides of a detector. And uh, in 89 and 90, 89, just a very first part of the detector were installed, in 90 a bigger part, but there were a lot of difficulties and hardware failure, and as happens sometimes with new technique, which is not unexpected. But as also often when there are difficulties, there were tensions between the two collaborating institute, and the spokesman at the time, that was me, <laughs> had to try to calm things down. And I have to say that at all time, uh, in this occasion, was Lorenzo was extremely helpful because his fairness was never adopted by anybody of any group at any time. So he could, he, he, was, he was known, he was like that. So uh, he could greatly help calm the situation and we focus on solving hardware problems, solving the other problem, uh, relationship problem in a better way. And in 1991 data taking, the detector worked beautifully and the results were very nice, so I showed first the vertex detector with the little jewel, which was made of silicon. Uh, I should have said, yes, there were two groups, and it was not a surprise. These were a group which had had experience at the SPS with this kind of detector. Uh, the PISA group from the Fram experiment, you've heard, and the CERN Munich from another experiment, I don't remember, any 12 or any I don't remember something, which was in a, another beam line in the north area where they also work with uh, silicon. 
So, uh, an example of physics with the VDET, with the Tau lifetime. <laughs> and after the year 91 of data taking, we had 6,000 Tau decay, which were accumulated. And uh, we published our results, which were better than any other published result at that time. And uh, I give the, uh, the value of uh, 291 plus or minus 1.3 plus or minus 0.6. Not, not six plus or minus point six. Uh, and uh, of course, at the end of the Z0, it was much better. Now, what is written there is two ways of measuring the lifetime. Uh, one is using two tree prong tau. So you have a tau which decays to tree prong, you have a tau which decays to tree prong. You measure the vertex on both sides, and the distance between the two is of course linked to the lifetime, and you see the curve that the distance, because of measurement error, is not uh, always positive, but you see that it's more positive and negative, and you get the lifetime from that. And uh, if you have single prong decay, it's a bit more complicated. You look at impact parameter difference. In our, the article we publish, we look at correlation, and we give lifetime from that, and the result you've seen. Uh, so I mentioned also only this, but the VDET was also essential for uh, B tagging, which was used on many, many of the uh, of the results, so it was really a beautiful instrument, uh, which was there. Now I spend uh, one or two slides on the LLV episode, uh, which was a problem we had at the time. Uh, now, what is LLV? Is uh, it's a second order QED process where you have a Z0 going to a high energy lepton pair, which you call LL, and then uh, one of the lepton can emit a Bremsstrahlung, but it can be a virtual Bremsstrahlung, which converts to a pair, which you call the V. So this is what's called the LLV. Now, what I describe now is uh, the standard QED way to have an LLV event. The question is, was well, there something else? Now, one physicist group in Aleph found from 1989 and 90 data, these events were more frequent when the LL was a tau tau compared to mu mu or ee. E. Uh, Fifteen events were found in the tau tau group where uh, you would have expected four. Now the problem was to evaluate the significance. <laughs> uh, how sure you were about the four, include the possibility of systematic error, and debate got heated inside the collaboration. Uh, the collaboration started to split a bit, I mean, temper rose, until I asked uh, Lorenzo and uh, Johan Navido, who had also passed away very recently, to act as uh, referees. And they did a very careful job, the, uh, discussing with the proponent, discussing with the opponents, uh, trying to, to see what was reasonable, what exaggerated. <laughs> And finally, the collaboration unanimously agreed to publish and sign their carefully suggested uh, version. And uh, then Lorenzo gave the CERN seminar, which was presenting the out of view and not a single group view. <laughs> so uh, now, as you know, uh, it turned out to be a statistical fluctuation, but uh, Lorenzo understanding diplomacy and firmness was very important in that result. And uh, my bet is that you can not uh, the, uh, <coughs> So this is the, uh, the last slide of his seminar, where I think it's very nice. He starts with, uh, if, uh, if the effect is a statistical fluctuation, I am sorry <laughs> for taking the time of the seminar. And what is also very important, what he says, that if it is new physics, something unexpected, then what it cannot be is Higgs or things like that, because then you would have uh, you know, symmetric decay, spherically symmetric decay uh, of the place where you would put the Higgs. Okay? And, uh, and so, you say, if it's new physics, it's not this thing which people might have discussed. So uh, he concluded, we have something at the 1% level, and uh, 
what we will see in the future with our next data and with the other collaboration, what happens. And uh, so it ended that it was a statistical fluctuation, but to me it went and ended correctly. So the changeover. <laughs> so in 1993, uh, after my three years as spokesman, uh, Lorenzo was elected as spokesman and we had a party at Schnevex for the changeover, uh, which is a tradition. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the next two pictures are coming from this party. And they, uh, <laughs> at least uh, three other physicists seem not to be unhappy about the, the changeover. <laughs> I would even say four, there was one behind, which, which is also having fun. <laughs> uh, now, this, this picture was also, uh, which has been quoted uh, often. Uh, I think it even made the CERN Courier, uh, showing that uh, you know, we can relax from time to time. But uh, it's not the only one from the party, uh, because sometime before the picture of the previous slide, we had some, uh, uh, obvious, I don't remember the subject, but some obviously very uh, uh, serious discussion <laughs> with uh, Jack, Lorenzo, and I. And uh, when I remember the moments together with uh, Lorenzo and Aleph, I like to have these two pictures in my mind. Uh, good relaxed time, but more often the intense exchange. Uh, now, during uh, Lorenzo's responsibility, we had a serious problem. On April 93, on the cooling down of the solenoid, there was a leak which developed between the liquid helium circuit and the vacuum. But mysteriously, the problem disappeared. So nobody has understood how it could disappear, but it disappeared, so we said fine. But it came back again after data taking in January 94, and uh, we were really afraid that we were going to lose one full year of data taking after that. Uh, luckily, the problem turned out to be accessible. Well, if you accept to use a lathe at six meter uh, or seven meter in the air, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the problem was a, a junction of aluminum and brass pipe. And the repair was done thanks to the dedication of our technical coordinator, Pierre, who was there. Uh, and CERN and SACLA personnel, and we lost no data taking time. It was a, a remarkable ending. But uh, a spokesman role is difficult in such cases. Uh, luckily, I didn't have one, but I can imagine because technically uh, you cannot help. I mean, your, your stomach hurts, but uh, the competent people, it's not you. So the best you can have, you can do, is to have good people, give them your conference, encouraged them, and this is what Lorenzo did, but it must have been a very hard time for him, nevertheless. Now, three years of spokesman, Lorenzo spokesman, question mark? Well, you know the story because you heard this morning <laughs> his role at uh, CERN. After one year of spokesman job, he's then taken away from us by Chris to form as DG team and uh, <laughs> uh, become uh, uh, director for physics uh, at CERN. Uh, we were quite frustrated. I mean, we thought that this was uh, unfair <laughs> to pick us our, our spokesman. And I think it shows the altruistic nature of Lorenzo because I cannot imagine it can be more fun to be a research director than an Aleph spokesperson. So it can only be a sense of duty. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, uh, out of decided that if they could not have Lorenzo, then they would choose a former TISA student. So uh, Hollande was elected <laughs> and took over as spokesman from 94 and 97. But as you can read, the, the story doesn't end there because in 2001, the collaboration chose as spokesman Roberto Tanchini, who happened to be also a former TISA student of Lorenzo. So I think this is amazing that the collaboration chooses a physicist and later two of his PhD students. Uh, probably never happened before, probably will never happen in the future. <laughs> uh, it doesn't decrease the merit of uh, Gigi and Roberto to note that uh, it says something about Lorenzo's capacity to attract uh, good physicists and train them in an excellent way. Because, uh, uh, so my last slide. Uh, as you've seen, uh, I enjoy very much 
uh, on what we have done together in Alnef. It was a wonderful time. It was a privilege to have known Lorenzo. Of course, in there I focused on the physics, but there were also many good times at home with a meal and a drink, talking of many other things than physics. And I can only end by saying thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Jacques. So now we have Jim Verdi, Lorenzo, and CMS. <laughs> It's a real honor for me to uh, uh, give a talk at this celebration, and thank you, Gigi, for the invitation. Uh, I think at the outside, I must say, Lorenzo commanded uh, great respect and admiration across the whole collaboration, and I'll try to give you some flavor of that. Uh, there are three distinct periods uh, where Lorenzo had his impact on CMS. Uh, before 1993, as the LHCC main referee of CMS, and then 94 to 98 as a CERN director of research, and then as a CB chair and a member. In fact, the parts one and two are probably less well known uh, because uh, only a few of us uh, really interacted uh, very closely with him, and I had the privilege to be one of those people. So I go back a long time with Lorenzo with intimate contact during the periods uh, which were sometimes difficult. So let me just say, the, uh, Lorenzo has left an indelible mark, uh, not only in CMS, but also on the LHC project. Uh, I think uh, Sergio gave you some uh, idea of that. Both very challenging, in fact. And I think uh, the fact that the LHC and, this, and CMS, and indeed the other experiments, are performing well, and, and CMS is performing beyond design, has something to do with Lorenzo. Uh, I think uh, Sergio mentioned some of those things this morning. Now, to indicate that uh, uh, CMS has done quite well is this iconic image, which was taken uh, one month after the first data taking, uh, just as uh, Lorenzo had finished as a CB chair, so running from our main referee to the end of the CB chair. Uh, this plot, I think, was uh, partly inspired by Gigi uh, in the way it's made. Uh, and you can see 50 years of particle physics uh, on one plot. So to look at the performance of the experiment, you zoom into the upsilon, and there you see the width of the upsilon, which is, uh, was, uh, our design goal was 70 MeV, and we found some like 67 MeV. So great success. Now let me look at Lorenzo and the LHC project timeline as such. Uh, it was after uh, the discovery of the WNZ bosons, the Higgs became something quite important for us to look for. And there was a workshop uh, organized uh, in Lausanne. It was really the ECFO workshop in Aachen, which I think uh, was men mentioned this morning by uh, Manfred, but where we really first understood that we could possibly build the detectors, do the physics we wanted to do. It was not an obvious thing to do, and I'll indicate that using one of the uh, questions that Lorenzo asked us as a referee. And then there was this general meeting. So that's when uh, Lorenzo started uh, as, uh, at, at, uh, as a principal referee of uh, CMS as part of the LHCC. So that's uh, indicated on the left-hand side. There was a general meeting on the LHC physics and detectors in Avion, and four presentations were made. And then immediately afterwards, uh, we were uh, asked for letters of intent. Uh, and, uh, and I'll say a few more words about that. And also, the, as director of research, uh, uh, as has been mentioned by Sergio, he actually invented many of the bodies that were necessary to make sure uh, that the experiments and the, uh, would actually function well and would be put on a sound footing as such, both financially and managerially. And uh, the last part, which I'll uh, talk about later. Okay, so this is the first period. And I'll actually spend a bit more time on this because I think uh, in preparing this talk, uh, Gigi actually gave uh, uh, his files uh, to, and I looked at those files and these were the first times I saw what he was writing in the LHCC, but I had never seen those before. And I'll try to give you a summary of that. So, but before I do that, uh, let's look uh, again. I mentioned this ECWA workshop. 
And that led to the creation of the detector R&D committee called the DRTC, because it wasn't obvious that we knew how to build these detectors. And then there is this general meeting in Avion, and there were four expressions of interest, ASCOT, CMS, Eagle, and L3P. And because there was an indication that there would only be two experiments approved, there was a creation of the scientific peer review committee called the LHCC. And, uh, and Lorenzo was part of it, and I'll show you something on that. And then started the marriage talks. So since there were going to be two, uh, then either the marriages had to be arranged or to be uh, shotgun marriages or uh, be left at the altar, as they say. So this, uh, I put this up uh, because I'm going to use it a little bit later in trying to understand why CMS uh, got through. Uh, the criteria were very good muon identification and measurement, uh, high energy uh, resolution for electromagnetic calorimeters, and powerful inner tracking systems, and hermetic calorimetry. Now, in all of these things, uh, I think the previous speakers have indicated that Lorenzo did have quite uh, good expertise in these things, which uh, I think he brought to bear uh, unknowingly to us. Now, I also show this uh, uh, plot again, because what you notice here is in uh, light green is the, the tracker first, which is the central part, and the light green is the calorimeter, crystal calorimeter, it covers a full solid angle essentially, and there's a coil uh, which uh, uh, has, houses all of the calorimeters inside, and on the outside there are four muon stations, and I'll come back to that uh, in, in terms of the uh, discussions at the LHCC. Now, this was the first meeting which took place on October 1992, so that's the minutes of that. And Carlo was the one who f spoke first, and uh, I'm underlining the stuff which is uh, relevant. The right machine for the advance of the subject and future of CERN. Approval of LHC experiments could not follow traditional procedures. The costs of the experiments would not be negligible compared with the machine, and very large numbers of physicists would be involved. And there are other problems. So it was clear that some other mechanism had to be set up uh, to actually uh, prove and also monitor these experiments as they went forward. And for CMS, uh, Lorenzo was uh, named as the main coordinator, the main referee. Now, the LHCC formally started its business uh, with that meeting, in a sense, and it had turned out before, uh, a marriage had been brokered between Ascot and Eagle and turned into Atlas. And CMS and L3P could not reach an agreement uh, on a mutually acceptable design and submitted their LOIs separately. But the discussions did continue on for a few more months. And uh, eventually the CMS uh, uh, and ATLAS uh, letters of intent were accepted to move forward. And I'll give you a bit more detail on that. Now here I come to the notes, the slides that uh, Lorenzo showed at the first LHCC meeting. And so he's going to go through uh, the various parts of CMS, and uh, the magnet is carefully thought, design, high competence, deport, deport my own prejudice. And the magnet committee was also Pierre Lazarus, who's uh, uh, sitting in the back. And so they were actually uh, discussing the feasibility of uh, this uh, risky solenoid that we had in CMS. And in tracking, apart from silicon, uh, we were also looking at MSGCs and scintillating fibers. Uh, so MSGC, a lot of R&D was going on, and, uh, he, his, uh, uh, and I'll have a special slide for MSGCs in a minute. But we also had scintillating fibers, which is probably not known. And this is one of the first things you, you'll notice a trend uh, in, in the way he actually presents the information to the LHCC. Is this really a viable alternative? So he's asking a question, uh, expecting an answer, which he knows what it should be. Um, but he wants it from us. Uh, then e ECAL, and, uh, and this, this after the LOI, these are discussions taking place, uh, and uh, so they're shifting to Shashlik. Uh, and there was also something else going on. We didn't have enough money. Uh, I think each collaboration, this was pre-SSC days, each collaboration had about 300 million. So you couldn't afford some of these things, like the Shashlik, uh, the costs are given, 107 compared to 52. So if you took the second one, it would eliminate uh, the need for staging. So there's a lot of discussions going on in the background. And he was always helping us in trying to understand what we ought to be doing, but never telling us it's the questioning method he used. So then there's the next one here, which is this summary. 
in the first meeting. He says first, nice, conclusions, nice, simple-minded. Now that really ought to make you think, uh, him writing simple-minded. So that's the way he's actually saying, well, think about things very carefully. So the general structure is defined tracking frozen, e gamma two options, hadron calorimeter defined, and so all good, good and nice. Then he talks about microstrip gas detect chambers as well. So now on the left-hand side, you see another trend that he has. He asks a question, he puts an answer, then he says attractions and worries. So this is a, a sort of a discourse that he's having, perhaps with himself, but in front of the committee as such. MSG is still in childhood, and he's asking the questions, how much time is needed to reach a conclusion? What would be the fallback solution if it doesn't work? And then he says, well, the MSGs are actually making good progress. They're in adolescence. And uh, the attractions are good granularity and uh, good resolution. And worries, well, substrate charging up industrial yield. So these kind of questions. So that's the first meeting. Then he asks another question. Uh, now that goes to the heart of the issue that I was talking to you about. He says, what can your electromagnetic calorimeter do in a standalone mode? I mean, if you have to switch off your inner tracking because of excessive rate. We have pixels now, which are operating well. At that time, it wasn't obvious. And uh, so this is a, a saying which was in the prevalent in the 1980s. We think we know how to build a high energy, high luminosity hadron collider. We don't have the technology to build a detector for it. So one has to remember these kind of things, which uh, Lorenzo was uh, asking. And of course, we gave some answer, which was reasonable, I think. Now, then comes this issue of uh, what to do. And so this is a, a letter from the uh, chairman of the LACC sent to, uh, uh, to, to us uh, and copied to Carlo, uh, uh, Walter, and Lorenzo. I won't read all of it. Uh, there are good points of CMS, but in the end, uh, neither CMS nor L3P collaborations alone are considered to have the resources to build their respectively proposed detectors, and combining of efforts is desirable. So they are indicating we should try to marry it uh, at you know, a reasonable cost, uh, perhaps, or at any cost. And that really didn't happen. And these are now Lorenzo's notes from the, I think, the meeting, which is meeting number seven. Again, you see this, uh, this notion, this way of his discourse. He says the question. So he puts a question. So he's not answering, but he expects the committee to reach the answer itself by this questioning approach. So then he puts scene from very far. So as if he's disarming everybody, it, clearly he knows what he's uh, going to be saying, but he's seen from very far. Uh, he's asking people to really think about things. That's how I interpret this. And then he looks at the common components. There's a large solenoid uh, and, and so on and so on. The obvious difference is that the HCAL is inside the coil and uh, in one case and outside the other case. So we considered lots of things and we gave him a lot of information which I won't reproduce. So again, he uses this technique of simple-minded conclusion. And of course, nothing is simple-minded here. Then he compares the L3P design which is shown on the right-hand side. In fact, their, their tracking started 1.5 meters from the beam line. There was nothing between that and the beam line. So he says 1.5 meters empty around the beam. Only two detectors in the Mion station, and would be a killer if he had only two. A factor of two in crystal volume for less coverage. Probably a, a twice the resolution of the jets, and, uh, and the, the only two layers in Mion detectors would cause difficulties for trigger coverage and redundancy. And then comes the, the killer phrase, which is this loss really needed? And uh, again, it's a question. He hasn't given the answer, he's questioning. And so the referee's opinion, which is uh, an opinion of the referees, is a viable experiment uh, and support for the chain choice of Shashlik, appreciates the st staging scenario, R&D is needed, and recommend that the experiment uh, be led to proceed towards a technical proposal, which it was. So that's what happened in, uh, ninth, in June 1993. So, now, when I was looking at all of this, it reminded me of the ancient Greeks, and they had a method of uh, doing things it's called the Socratic method, and that Socrates there. And uh, then I looked into the uh, 
Wikipedia and they give this description of the Socratic method is a form of inquiry and discussion between individuals based on asking and answering questions to stimulate critical thinking and to illuminate ideas. But I think it's, uh, there's another one which I think was much closer to Lorenzo, which is that a discussion process during which a facilitator promotes independent, reflective, and crit critical thinking. And I think this is what I pick up. And uh, it's only looking at those transparencies. Uh, but I think it was all the way through. Uh, now I look back on things, uh, the way discussions, uh, even during this period as a research director and as a CB chair would go. OK, so as director of research now. So this is a slide of, uh, there are lots of things happening. So I'm picking up things related to CMS. Uh, it's under his uh, uh, tenure that the final approval of CMS uh, took place and he would be a, you know, was a constant guide to us. And there were procedures set up to move towards technical design reports and the resources review boards. Now I think one cannot underestimate the amount of effort that was required to set these things up because you have to understand these experiments had people from 40 countries, about 50 different funding agencies because some had two funding agencies, they are different traditions and all had to be uh, convinced uh, that this huge undertaking, which is going to cost half a billion francs, would succeed. And it wasn't an easy thing to do. And he also set up these meetings with the collaboration management once every month for two or three hours. We would uh, sit and discuss all our problems, and he would get very, very sage advice and help us. Uh, uh, and I'll pick up one of the cases where Crystal's production he helped uh, us uh, very much. And he gave uh, technical, financial, and managerial advice uh, to, to us uh, as the leaders of the experiment. And also brought in many people from uh, different countries, and uh, especially from uh, Italy. On a personal note, I was the first team leader of the CERN CMS group, and I had many, many interactions with uh, Lorenzo, which are not necessarily related to CMS as a whole, but CMS uh, CERN and Horst Weninger. Uh, to define the group's scientific technical contributions to CMS and its managerial structure and uh, budget required. And I must say, I found it very, very helpful and comforting to know that there was somebody like that you could go and ask. And then finally, we got uh, uh, approval for 75. And we joke about 475, but I think uh, Lorenzo uh, and also Chris did a lot of work uh, working with the funding agencies, working with the, uh, with the experiments, and trying to understand uh, the resources would be there, and then set the ceiling, uh, which, would be, which would give us the best experiments possible. Okay, one example is uh, Lorenzo led tungsten at uh, Crystal's production, and I think there was another theme that is coming through in this meeting today, that he was quite innovative in his uh, thoughts in terms of uh, detectors, uh, and so he liked novel detectors. Uh, Crystal, Crystal's were novel, he had direct interest and curiosity for this work. And uh, once CMS had chosen Lead Tungstead for his uh, calorimeter, he was very supportive. Uh, and we needed to develop uh, and produce uh, you know, 75,000 crystals in 10 years, not an obvious thing to do. So he took some of the risks uh, on our behalf as a certain uh, director of research, uh, investing money uh, directly uh, in the company that we finally chose. And he also set up, uh, helped uh, Franz Hein and Paul Lecoq to set up a collaboration within the framework of a newly born organization called ISTC. I uh, read from downstairs, the aim of the ISTC was to offer highly skilled scientists working in the form of Soviet Union's military research programs opportunities to redirect their talents to peaceful activities. And they produce these crystals for us. And I think uh, uh, CMS particularly appreciated Lorenzo's forthright support, especially for novel technologies. And this was very welcome and CMS uh, always seemed to be pushing the technology envelope. And this is a, a proof of the letter where he's uh, putting a lot of money of CERN uh, into this project. So let me go to the next phase, which I think, uh, uh, again, Sergio has, uh, uh, has uh, outlined. And I, I use the word tiptoeing to mem memorandum of understanding, because it wasn't an obvious thing, uh, because people were quite worried as to what it means to uh, sign up uh, with the memorandum of understanding. And so it took a lot of drafts, I think about 30, 40 drafts, uh, going between uh, CERN management and the experiments and the correction and the funding agencies to actually come to some sort of a draft. And Lorenzo guided that process deftly, I'd say. And uh, so each party felt that their voice was being heard. Because in the end, what you have to do is to make sure that every constituent 
owns the experiments and the accelerator, whether they be funding agency or the experiments, all CERN, and so on, and that was done well. And so, as you notice, it's, uh, there's a phrase in there, it is understood that the document has no legal implications, uh, and so on. So you had to do that, and nobody has reneged so far on any of the uh, commitments made in the, uh, in the... And the memorandum of understanding came uh, in 98, and that was for the construction phase, and I won't... Uh, I'll let you read that later. Now, when he left uh, CERN, he became CB chair after one year. He was elected, and then uh, uh, stayed for three terms. Those were the most crucial years when uh, CMS was uh, at, at most peril, in a sense, where we were constructing and so on. And at times, uh, he actually became a graduate student. I, I know that, uh, although he's admiring this thing, I know from the younger members of PISA group that he was actually doing shifts on the uh, silicon tracker that was being built here. So one transparency on, on some of the things which I've uh, mentioned already. I think the job of the uh, CB chair is also to keep the machinery of the collaboration running smoothly, which he did, and uh, uh, be a constant source of advice to the spokesperson. Michelle and I consulted Lorenzo frequently on diverse issues concerning CMS, and he always provided penetrating and prescient advice. I used to talk to him almost every two weeks uh, to keep him informed. Uh, he had this nice way, then he would listen, and only if you were not going quite the right path, he would tell you that. Uh, but otherwise, he'd let you go along your path. Even if it was slightly odd, he would let you do that. And there are several difficult decisions that had to be handled, uh, change from MSG to all silicon tracker and some others. Uh, it was always easy to discuss all types of issues with Lorenzo and invariably reached a quick uh, uh, understanding and common understanding how to proceed. So, so that's the old silicon tracker and the CMS closed in 2008 and uh, let me take a few more words. One of the things that also characterized him was, uh, I think has said, been said by quite a few people, he was quite proud of uh, the CMS thesis committee because it allowed him to uh, be closer to the younger members of CMS. And he always had quite a lot of joy in seeing the younger members of CMS doing well. Now, just a little bit of physics and to look a little bit forward, because I think he would have liked that. So that's the candidate for lepton candidate. And uh, Giovanni has already shown you these things uh, in quite great detail. And uh, what I wanted to pick up was this one. So we found a Higgs boson. Uh, so is this it? Uh, what about new physics? Uh, in a world of standard model Higgs boson, is there any room for new physics? All of us essentially believe that there must be new physics, but we don't know what it is. There are some real reasons and virtual reasons to believe in new physics. The real reasons, and perhaps the most compelling reason, is uh, the origin of dark matter, neutrino masses. The virtual reasons uh, are naturalness and so on. So there's a fair amount of work to do. And I'll probably uh, mention this transparency because it's rather it's a transparency from the early 1990s and I haven't really changed very much so these are the five points what we were talking about now clearly point number two we've uh, made progress we found uh, a Higgs boson which probably does atta uh, tackle that problem but there's another one which is number three which we have to make sure that it uh, also solves the problem of unitarity so that's a closure test for the standard model and which has to still to be done but numbers four and five are really big problems, and I, one can't say that uh, the end of physics is such. It, they are really massive problems uh, which need tackling, and maybe we will find some answers to that at the LHC in the next run. So the discovery of the Higgs boson is just the start of the exploration of the Terra scale. Uh, next year, we're going to double the energy, and I think lying ahead of us is an exciting 20-year program in equal parts uh, precision measurements, and not only of the new boson, but also of the standard model. If you don't get clues, uh, it's a top factory, it's a B factory, and so on. So we'll be looking for deviations uh, and the searches for direct searches of new particles. Now, one other last thing that I wanted to mention was that uh, Higgs was discovered really in the bosonic modes, and the fermionic modes did not talk. And the object is supposed to give mass also to the fermions. And uh, so this is a paper that was CMS submitted uh, uh, a few months ago on looking at the, uh, the fermionic modes, and there is clear evidence that uh, it's okay and the right strength uh, given the errors. So when we learned about Lorenzo passing away, it was very sad. 
uh, we decided to uh, dedicate that particular paper, which was going to be sent into Nature, because it's quite an important paper as well. And uh, I will read this part, because I think this is what most of CMS, all of CMS, uh, 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 has this high regard for, uh, for Lorenzo. So this paper is dedicated to our dear colleague and friend, Professor Lorenzo Foa, who passed away on January 13, 2014. Lorenzo's contributions to CMS was unique and left an indelible impact on the experiment in all its phases. Lorenzo was the CMS principal referee in the CERN LHC committee during the approval process, initiated the participation of many groups during the formation of the CMS collaboration, provided prescient advice and guidance during his period as CERN Director of Research, was chair of CMS Collaboration Board during the critical phase of construction, and was the first chair of the thesis award committee, enabling him to stay close to the young physicists. And this was accepted by Nature and should be coming out soon. And all I can say is thank you to Lorenzo on behalf of CMS. Thank you, Jim. Now, come at the end of the day, dear Gigi, Thank it's you, for you. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you again to everybody. It's, uh, I would like to start this last session that will be a bit personal uh, with reading uh, two messages from two people that have been very close to Lorenzo in his life uh, and uh, that cannot be here. One is uh, Giorgio Bellettini and uh, that uh, wrote this letter asking me to read it. It will take five minutes, it's not so short. Dear Gigi, I apologize once more for not being with you at the Scuola today. I will be involved in person in the annual user meeting in Fermilab. I still want to honor Lorenzo with this message. I am disoriented by seeing such a close friend leaving abruptly. I am not used to keep in mind that our future is short. And now I am forced to halt and think this makes me uneasy. I have not been seeing Lorenzo frequently in, the, in recent years. However, I realized that he still was part of my life. Old feelings that moderate my temper, events that, have, that are not fading away, I read the roots in my life. His disappearance is forcing me brusquely to consider these grounds, to think back to what is left of my experience with him. Although my, mo my memory is often shaky, I am finding that I can reconstruct quite well our old relationship. I am even able to understand the value of the, mes the message that I got from him. Early in the 60s, Ted Bellamy and I were discussing at the physics department of Pisa about how one could measure the paid zero lifetime. My professor, Franzinetti, was helping me to build a group there. He knew that Lorenzo had recently got his laurea in nuclear physics and suggested that I should ask the that smart young guy to move to particle physics and be part of the group. Of course, I was happy. The group had to grow, and I knew so little of particle physics that the idea of collaborating with somebody as green as myself cheered me up. You have seen before from Piero, uh, Piero Stock that the group, the oldest person in the group was George and was 28. Huh? I met Lorenzo for the first time when he came to Florence and, uh, from Florence to Pisa to hear about our proposed collaboration for Frascati experiment. His personality was uh, as different from mine as I could possibly imagine. I was used to make a big fuss in front of the blackboard, proposing ideas and jumping from one problem to another. Lorenzo was sitting in a corner of the room, listening and asking only a few rare questions. Like, what, what is this? He would never expose himself. His only interest was to understand. He continued like that for a while. However, when a few months later, Carlo Bemporad was already experienced in digital electronics, joined the group, and we could begin designing an experiment in practice, it became clear that Lorenzo had carefully and in silence accumulated information and knowledge. He then spoke up and he was able to contribute to design openly and incisively. Later, when building and installing and running the photoproduction experiment, his skills appeared crystal clear. He would never do things inaccurately or leave the job half done. 
He would not speak loud, but perceptibly enough to make his point clear. He would contribute for real, not to pretend to. He was always available and never tired when some duty was calling. He slept conveniently in, in, uh, or only barely possible when traveling by train or at laboratory desk or sitting on a chair. I invite him so very much for this, since my sleep is much more fragile. I discovered this, his style and these qualities of Lorenzo at the time of Frascati experiment, when we were less than 30 years old, but I wisely rely, relied on them more, than more, uh, more and more during over 12 years of our work together. With time, Lorenzo became the reference person for all problems of our group. In the ISR PISA Stony Brook experiment, a very daring and difficult endeavor in the late 60s, I was the group leader, but the prime manager of the experiment was Lorenzo. After the, exper the ISR experiment, he started a new group and a new experiment at CERN SPS, where he could exploit fully his leadership skills and the show is his wide knowledge of high energy physics. Since then, his impressive career at CERN and eventually his chair at the Square Normale of Pisa have crowned his role in energy physics as appropriate. At the, at the Pisa Physics Department, which experienced an, an, uh, an amazing blooming since 60, the contribution given by Lorenzo shall be, shall be forever acknowledged. We should now look forward. My best affectionate wish is to Paola, to Lorenzo's son and daughters, and friendly welcome to all colleagues convened at Scuola Normale in occasion of this symposium. Giorgio Bellettini. Thank you. I will report to Giorgio. And then I have a message from Jack. Jack really wanted to come. Uh, and uh, I spent a uh, good two hours in his office uh, to tell him not to come. I mean, Jack is 92 now, and, uh, uh, sorry? 93. 93. Uh, Jack is 93, and, uh, uh, I mean, cannot come here alone. Uh, and it was not possible to arrange somebody who could uh, take care of him coming here. Dear colleagues, dear Paula, Please excuse me for not being with you today, and I thank you for allowing me to transmit a few words. A big part of the pleasure in our work is the contact with our colleagues, and Lorenzo in his work, and Paola as a, uh, as a friend, and Lorenzo and Paola as friends, played the very important and beneficial roles in my life. Lorenzo was a major contributor to the success of the Aleph experiment at LEP from its beginning to its end. He helped in its design, in, its, uh, in, in the acceptance by the committee, organized and supervised the construction of the iron calorimeter, and was spokesperson for some years. He was my boss at, as director of physics at the Square Normale in Pisa when I taught there for some years after re retirement at CERN. Even more important for me, is the long-time friendship with Lorenzo and Paola, their hospitality in Pisa, sailing together quite often in their boat or in mine, visiting Lorenzo and Paola in their house on the Madalena Island. I hope that you, Paola, can accept this difficult loss. Jack. <laughs> now Paola will say a few words. Io dico due parole in italiano, mi scuso. Un grazie commosso a tutti voi che siete venuti oggi qui a ricordare Lorenzo, a quelli che sono stati i suoi laureandi, poi laureati, poi collaboratori negli esperimenti, a quelli che sono andati poi a lavorare lontano e agli amici di sempre che ci sono stati vicini per tutta l'attività scientifica di Lorenzo. Sono stati vicini alla nostra famiglia per tutti quegli anni. Lorenzo aveva una concezione della cultura molto vasta. Per lui cultura non erano solo letteratura, storia, arte o musica. Letter era, let 
cultura era anche la scienza e nel caso suo in particolare la fisica. Per questo ne ha sempre parlato. Non so se vi siate accorti che Lorenzo eh, rimaneva rarissimamente a mangiare alla mensa della normale. Veniva sempre a casa perché per lui a tavola essere a tavola insieme voleva dire scambiarsi esperienze, parlare del lavoro e del lavoro ha sempre parlato fino all'ultimo giorno del suo lavoro. Io e Lorenzo ci siamo conosciuti attraver proprio attraverso la fisica. Lui si è laureato a Firenze, come diceva prima Piero Braccini, nella fisica delle basse energie sull'esistenza di uno stato isomerico del niobio. Un giorno, mentre mi spiegava in cosa consisteva il suo esperimento, io mi sono accorta, guardando il grafico, che un certo puntino non stava dove lo aveva messo lui, ma doveva stare più in basso. Questo gli è costato la bellezza di due o tre mesi in più di misurazione per convincere questo puntino a stare dove lui aveva previsto. Da quel momento mi ha sempre raccontato dei suoi esperimenti. Naturalmente non sono più stato in grado di trovare gli errori nei grafici. Dopo la laurea è venuto qui a Pisa, come voi sapete, in piazza Torricelli, in un grande stanzone dove io ogni tanto andavo a trovarlo e dove stava con Giorgio Bellettini e Ted Bellamy, un fisico inglese, sicuramente un bravissimo fisico, dal mio punto di vista però un grande stimatore della cucina italiana. <ride> Questo stanzone somigliava pochissimo a un laboratorio di ricerca in fisica. A me, che arrivavo lì da fuori, sembrava piuttosto un'officina di meccanica molto disordinata. Ogni tanto arrivava Romana Torelli che faceva un esperimento lì accanto che cercava, tentava di rimettere un po' d'ordine in vano. L'esperimento è poi stato portato ai laboratori di Frascati, al sincrotrone di Frascati. Nel frattempo al gruppo si erano aggiunti Carlo Bemporad e Pierluigi Braccini. Il laboratorio di Frascati era finalmente, dal mio punto di vista, un vero centro di ricerca. L'esperimento che facevano mi sembra che fosse sempre una un esperimento di fotoproduzione. E si servivano di una targhetta che io conservo ancora a casa, di queste dimensioni, fatta di tanti cerchi concentrici, malamente tenuti insieme da delle viti. <ride> Eravamo un po' ai primordi di, della fisica. Ogni tanto si servivano anche di me. Quando li andavo a trovare mi mettevano a fare lo scanning e dovevo individuare due fotoni in concomitanza temporale. Mi sembrava di partecipare in qualche modo anch'io all'esperimento. Poi si sono occupati del... Eh, della vita media del Paesero attraverso l'effetto Primakov. Ricordo che questo esperimento è costato non solo una fatica intellettuale, ma una vera e propria fatica fisica, perché per difendere l'esperimento dovevano spostare grossi blocchi di, di, di piombo e che spesso spostavano anche durante la notte, insomma, quando potevano. C'è un episodio buffo che riguarda Lorenzo che durante, alla fine di una serie di turni si è addormentato su un blocco di cemento, la mattina dopo gli operai l'hanno sollevato col carro ponte, siccome aveva un sonno molto duro non si è svegliato, è stato trasferito da un'altra un parte della, della sala sperimentale. Sono insomma episodi un po' così, ecco. Eh, dopo questo esperimento, che è finito, che si è concluso bene, eh, è stata la volta di, di Desi, del, del laboratorio di Hamburgo. C'era questa, questa nuova macchina da 6 GEV che si prestava bene per ripetere l'esperimento con, con l'effetto Primakov, un po' come avevano fatto col Pai Zero, sulla vita media dell'ETA 
che avendo una massa molto superiore al Pi Zero aveva bisogno di una, di una macchina più potente. Eh, Piero e Lorenzo avevano preso contatti con un gruppo del, di Desi e tutta la famiglia si è poi trasferita a Amburgo per tutta la durata dell'esperimento. Abitavamo proprio dentro al centro di ricerca, con le famiglie di Ting, di Detlef, di Klaus Lugesmeier, dei fratelli Braunschweig. E lì veramente la contaminazione famiglia fisica è stata al massima. Eh, tanto che i miei figli, Damiano e Oliva, quando qualcuno ci veniva a trovare a Amburgo, erano soliti presentare Carlo Bradaschia e Rino Castaldi dicendo «Ecco i nostri laureandi!». <ride> Quello è stato un periodo veramente meraviglioso per tutti noi, <ride> le passeggiate sull'elba, il vivere insieme, pranzare, cenare insieme e ci sono altri episodi buffi di questo periodo, per esempio la caccia ai leprotti di Desi che... <ride> che Rino Castaldi, grande cacciatore, conduceva sul far della notte. Io e Lorenzo con la 500 abbagliavamo i leprotti e lui con un arco e le frecce tirava, tirava i leprotti. Do you understand me now? No. 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 Wait a second, I have to translate this one because Paola was saying that Paola and Lorenzo with, with the, the car, with the lights of the car, were stopping the rabbits. And Rino Castaldi with the arcs were just shooting to them. Con l'arco e le frecce perché bisognava cacciare alla pari le frecce. Arcs and arrows, yes. <laughs> Eh, eh, poi anche questo esperimento naturalmente è finito, mi sembra che fu proprio Lorenzo a presentare i dati alla SIF e uscì sempre eh, abbastanza modesto a parole dicendo mi sento ancora un fisico piccolo piccolo. <ride> Poi è stata la volta, vado avanti un po' veloce, per me è importante far vedere il rapporto che c'era fra la famiglia e la fisica, eh, l'esperienza de, degli ISR. Questo è stato un periodo in cui Lorenzo non era per niente soddisfatto, era entrato a far parte di un gruppo, mi sembra, di DIC, in cui gli italiani venivano considerati pochissimo, eravamo fisici molto poveri, l'Italia non contribuiva granché alle spese del CERN e hanno contribuito come hanno potuto, mi sembra. No, questo, l'esperimento di Dick, scusate, mi sono sbagliata, è pieno prima degli ISR, ecco. E, mi sembrava che fosse uno esperimento in cui cercavano ancora eh, Pi Zero e K, ecco. E stavano in un... Eh, avevano una trasferta eh, che più o meno bastava per un letto nelle baracche degli italiani e due pasti al CERN, ecco come... Eh? 2600. Ecco. <ride> gli AISAR invece sono stati un, un enorme progresso, ecco, perché lì gli italiani hanno cominciato a contribuire veramente. Eh, mi sembra che l'esperimento fosse in un luogo un po' sopraelevato rispetto al CERN, che veniva chiamato il castello dove Oliva e Damiano andavano correntemente a trovare il babbo, perché a quei tempi non esisteva il CERN, la sbarra o le, le guardie che fermano, bisogna presentare i documenti per entrare. La, il CERN era aperto alla città di Ginevra, alle campagne francesi e svizzere. Oggi purtroppo non è più così, ci saranno naturalmente delle buone ragioni. Poi l'esperimento Fram... Lorenzo dal 68 era diventato assistente di Bernardini, faceva lezione qui in normale, aveva cominciato ad avere tantissimi laureandi, poi laureati che vincevano concorsi, andavano 
a lavorare al CERN, naturalmente io racconto dal mio punto di vista, eh. andavano a lavorare al CERN nei suoi esperimenti e ricordo che lì, se non, ricordo, se non ricordo male, riuscì a ottenere dagli NFN un contributo per la ricerca di circa un milione, un, un milione? o un miliardo, non mi ricordo bene, forse un milione, un mil... però tanti soldi comunque. E mi ricordo che non dormiva la notte dalla preoccupazione di doverli spendere e di come spenderli. Hanno deciso poi di fabbricare dei rivelatori in silicio nell'officina di San Piero, fatti letteralmente a mano, hanno contribuito in parte anche i miei figli, che ogni tanto andavano lì a aiutare. <ride> e, se non ricordo male, è stato Aldo Menzione che ha realizzato un oggetto per misurare il punto di attraversamento delle particelle, per poterne misurare la vita media. Anche questo esperimento è finito, mi sembra, in maniera soddisfacente, come avete detto tutti. Eh? <ride> Poi, naturalmente, ci sono stati esperimenti sempre più grossi, come Aleph e poi CN, CMS. Abbiamo assistito alla, alla fabbricazione del, dell'EP1, dell'EP2, però ormai la fisica per me era diventata decisamente troppo difficile e i gruppi del CERN sono molto numerosi, per cui non era più così facile seguire l'evolversi della fisica ciò nonostante Lorenzo non ha mai perso le speranze ha sempre cercato di raccontarci gli esperimenti che stava facendo l'ha fatto anche in occasione del, del bosone di Higgs e anche pochi mesi prima della sua morte mi ha raccontato il contenuto di una tesi che stava leggendo questo per dire che questo, questa necessità di comunicare agli altri quello che sentiva, quello che faceva, era enormemente importante per lui. Devo anche ricordare un, un altro fatto che mi riguarda personalmente. Io, ho, come insegnante di scuola media, ho portato sei terze medie a partire dagli anni Ottanta in visita al CERN. Le lezioni prima della visita le preparava Lorenzo. Queste visite sono piaciute così tanto ai ragazzi che ben cinque di loro hanno deciso in quel momento che avrebbero studiato fisica. L'hanno fatto davvero e ora sono, purtroppo non in Italia, sono all'estero a lavorare e a fare i fisici. Per una strana circostanza, fra i camerieri che stavano giù a servirci il lunch, c'era uno dei miei alunni. La prima cosa che mi ha detto, non sapendo assolutamente come mai c'era questa ricorrenza, professoressa, si ricorda quando siamo andati in visita al CERN? È una cosa che non scorderò mai. In base a queste esperienze io avevo convinto Lorenzo, cosa che poi ha fatto ed è riuscito a ottenere, Lorenzo ha convinto la Regione Toscana a finanziare dei corsi di aggiornamento per gli insegnanti di fisica delle scuole superiori. Ora non so se si fanno ancora, perché purtroppo in questi periodi di miseria non è detto, si fanno ancora, meno male, eh, sono molto contenta. Poi naturalmente, come avete capito, come avrete capito i, questi rapporti famiglia fisica avvenivano spessissimo attraverso eh, i fisici che passavano da casa nostra, sia qui a Pisa sia alla Maddalena, come ci ricordava Jack Steinberger. Eh. E, a questo punto vi devo dire che la cosa che mi ha commosso di più di tutte quelle che sono state dette qui è l'aver sottolineato la capacità che aveva Lorenzo di affascinare i giovani, di far vedere loro quanto era bella la fisica, di vedersi accendere nei loro occhi, queste sono le parole sue, una lucina, una scintilla di entusiasmo che avrebbe poi dovuto accompagnarli per tutta la vita. 
Un'altra delle caratteristiche di Lorenzo importante che avete sottolineato è quella di eh, essere stat, essere, o aver tentato, come in parte esserci riuscito, di eh, tenere insieme i gruppi in cui ha lavorato, eh, capendo che sì, si, sta, si lavora su una varietà di, estrema varietà di problemi, ma che bisogna sempre tener conto e tener di mira quello che è lo scopo finale, il programma, lo scopo finale. Vi leggo solo due righe che il professor Bertram vi ha proiettato sulla lavagna all'inizio, ma che anch'io anch mi ero scritta perché sono parole che ho sentito ripetere spesso da Lorenzo, anche se queste le ha dette nel corso di un'intervista. Il contributo più vero, più fondamentale, è quello relativo ai ragazzi che ho tirato su, sfruttando il fatto che mi ha facilitato maledettamente di essere professore alla scuola normale, assistente prima e poi professore. Ne ho tirati su tanti. La metà dei ragazzi che fanno fisica delle particelle in questo edificio sono venuti fuori dalla scuola normale e da me. Quindi il mio vero contributo alla fisica delle particelle è stato i giovani fisici delle particelle. Grazie Paola, grazie moltissimo. And it's quite difficult for me to continue at this point after you. First of all, because uh, I mean, I feel myself part of your family. Huh? And uh, I was going to say all what you said. I mean, I, uh, my privilege has been to work with Lorenzo for so many years. And clearly I have not been close to Lorenzo as you have been. <laughs> But, uh, uh, I've shared so many hours of uh, life, so, so many things at work. And uh, um, for me, clearly, I would have said exactly the same. The main contribution to Lorenzo, Lorenzo to physics, has been uh, what he has done as mentor, as professor. Uh, he was in a privileged position. And clearly, Scuola Normale selects the few very best students, or tries to select the few very best students. We have. Uh, 10 physics students per year, huh? and, but are very, very good. Huh? And Lorenzo was charming, was charming, and as Fabio said, uh, he was really capable to convince, was trying to convince Fabio to work on, on particle physics, and the same was for me. I mean, I had started to work on solid state physics, huh? and then uh, one day I met Lorenzo, was uh, in Corso Italia, And uh, I, uh, I stopped him because I had seen him at the entrance uh, examination. And we start to talk. And then he brought me, just found in the, in the street. I went home in Via Lavagna. Uh, and we had dinner together. And we spent till two, the, the two o'clock in the night. Uh, and after that, uh, it was very difficult for me because I had to choose uh, between Professor Gozzini, a very famous, established, full professor at the physics department, and this young assistant. He was 35. So, but I really wanted to work with him. I mean, I had no idea what particle physics was. And, uh, and then, uh, let me say also another thing. Uh, Luciano, you said that Lorenzo was a very, group, a very good group leader because uh, he was a clear reference, but uh, he was letting us to work as we wanted. This is very true. But I am also sure that Lorenzo was guiding us since the beginning in the direction that he knew we would have succeeded the best. Huh? And uh, this, has been, in this has been very successful. I mean, many of the students that are here have been uh, um, playing a very, very important role in all the high energy physics experiment in the last years. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, in, it was uh, six months ago with Lorenzo, we were trying to make a list of, of his students. Huh? And uh, we stopped at some uh, 30 names. Huh? Uh, and uh, uh, this is a, a really impressive number. And uh, I, 
let me, let me read what I wrote. I mean, when we were young students, we were able to see, uh, he was able to see our skills, possibilities, and ambitions. He was capable to understand how we could have evolved, and he accompanied uh, us by end in the right direction. The road was very much easier after his advice. And uh, um, in, in his long career, Lorenzo has introduced dozens of students in the world of energy physics experiments and gathered around him uh, a community of young Italian physicists, passionate and enthusiastic. These young people growing up have designed, built, and put into operation main components of the great experiments that have made the recent history of particle physics. Lorenzo was proud to see in the eyes of his former student the spark of the pleasure of, for the research that he had been able to communicate so well to them. And uh, Lorenzo was mentor and friend. Uh, he was sharing with us the pleasure of the small uh, everyday research life, uh, and he was sharing with us his marvelous private life. I mean, for me, Paola, Oliva, Damiano, uh, Valentina, but Allegra, Ferruccio, and, and uh, the Gemelli uh, are part of my family. I mean, I, I feel really at home uh, when, when I come here in San Giuliano. And, uh, um, I mean, we have said many things about Lorenzo and his contribution to the, exper to the various experiments. Um, the, when we, we know how it was in Aleph, uh, in CMS, uh, in this large collaboration, and uh, when, when we, we have now all been part of this very large collaboration, but at the beginning it was very different. Huh? When I started to work in Fram uh, with uh, Luciano and Roberto, actually Lorenzo told me to go and talk to Roberto and Luciano uh, when I was uh, after this meeting. Huh? And so they were not uh, in the school. Huh? I was sleeping in one of the rooms here. And so I went, <laughs> the ringing on their bell at home was uh, 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think they remember. Huh? And, uh, um, and uh, we were living in a world, in a, in doing this Fram collaboration was only Italian collaboration. Huh? And I have grown up uh, in, in a laboratory where, uh, as uh, Nando was saying, they were building very new things, the magic box, the silicon detectors. Also, the, the drift chambers were very new that we were building at that time. And, uh, but the world was uh, really finishing at the wall of San Piero. Huh? What was, uh, was outside, we didn't care, simply. Huh? And then when we came to CERN, uh, we were uh, living between the North area and the, and the, and the, uh, and the, the offices in, in the Block 4. Huh? And rarely we were in Meren. Huh? So it was really something completely different. And uh, the, the, we, we didn't realize that there was another world of, behind, behind Fram. And then one day, um, and Lorenzo was communicating with the rest of the world for all of us. Huh? And, uh, and then one day Lorenzo came to see, called us in this block of four, uh, in one room of the block four, and told us that Jack Stenberger, really, Jack Stenberger, I mean, for me, Jack was a, a sort of god uh, by name. Jack Stenberger had contacted him because he wanted us to join Aleph. Uh, and then we started. Uh, um, um, uh, no, it was not Aleph yet, yeah, but, 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 yes, actually, you're right, very, very much I remember when we decided about the name. It was contacted us to go to, a, um, to work on LEP, and we had a long discussion about that, because it was a new world. Huh? And, uh, and then we joined, joined this collaboration, and uh, we, we went there, and then when we saw that this Aleph was really home for many of us, uh, and this was clear since the first day. And something that I really remember with uh, imp vivid impression is that there were group uh, meetings of the collaboration in, in uh, Building 6, and uh, there were discussions left and right, you mentioned some tensions here and there, but then there were Jack could stand up, or Jacques could stand up and then say where to go, and the discussion was closed. Huh? And uh, I was proud to see that also Lorenzo was capable to do that. I mean, for me, it was really, I saw Lorenzo uh, with, with different eyes. Huh? And then uh, this was the, the, the different world. Huh? The, 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 we started Aleph, and it was big physics, uh, and uh, all what we have seen up to now. And, uh, but uh, for me, and for many of us, uh, this uh, Lorenzo was uh, really the, 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 
the professor, the mentor, and the friend, uh, and the relation with his family, and also another characteristic of Lorenzo that he was speaking exactly in the, with the same, he was open to everybody. For the youngest student could come, he was devoting to him exactly the same attention as the, to the big professor. So, um, I mean, I, I think that Fabio said today that we should uh, celebrate Lorenzo, uh, and I think this was good. Uh, and uh, this, uh, we, we kept this, uh, this direction in, uh, for all the whole meeting, uh, and uh, this is uh, nice because I'm sure that is the way that he wants to be remembered by us. So, thank you, Lorenzo. You have been a mentor, friend, brother for me, and you will continue to live in my memories and uh, in all of your students and friends that are here. Thank you. Thank you.